Hi students, this lecture is over chapter 18, which is over electric charge and electric, electric fields. All right, so those of you who've taken, who took physics one, uh, as if you recall, we went through chapters one through 17 in Cutnell and Johnson. Uh, in this particular class, we're gonna start at chapter 18, where we left, basically where we left off. Okay, so before I um, delve into the actual contents of the chapter, uh, let's, uh, Let's talk, let's discuss, um, you know, first of all, what it is that we're actually going to do. Um, you know, I know I, 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 I talk, this is the, I talk a lot about, you know, some of these terms I'm about to give you back in a chapter one lecture. So some of this is going to repeat, particularly for those who uh, took me for physics one. But um, let's, let's go back and recall what we did in, in physics one real quick. All right. So. Remember back in, 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 in physics one, physics one, we covered two different theories. Uh, one um, called mechanics and one called thermal physics. Now, before we go on, uh, let's remind ourselves what a, what a theory is. All right, so again, let's, we're, Needed to go back and to redefine some terms that I talked about in physics one. But again, you know, some of you have had me for physics one and some of you haven't. So what is a theory? Again, it's a term that is used uh, in the vernacular uh, quite a bit, but um, most of the time it's used incorrectly. So a theory is a um, mathematical framework. that predicts, or that I would say uh, precisely predicts and models a uh, class of physical phenomena And it is fundamentally based on a set of laws and principles. All right, so again, as I've said many times, uh, math uh, theory has a particular scientific meaning to it. It is a mathematical framework that precisely predicts and, and models a class of physical phenomena, and it is fundamentally based on a set of laws and principles. Okay, now the question is, what is a law? Law of physics, what is that? So again, that's the basis of all theories. Okay, so absolute basis of any kind of theory are laws of physics. What is a law of physics? Law of physics is, it, it is a behavior in the universe or of the universe, let's say. That is always true. But it does not have a more 
fundamental cause. It is a primary cause. Okay, so if you were to ask a bunch of why questions, you know, why is this? Well, it's because of that. Well, and then why is that? It was because of this and so on and so forth. You have a, a long line of why questions. Eventually, you're going to lead to a question that is, uh, why is, let's say, Newton's second law? That's a law of physics. And if, the, and if you ask, ask that why question, the answer is nobody knows. It just is. So it is a primary cause. It is a fundamental starting point, a basis of any physical theory, a law of physics, okay? So nobody knows why it, it is a starting point. It's like when you took geometry, for many of you, geometry was your first ever um, proof-based mathematics class. Now, geometry is entirely definition, theorem, proof, definition, theorem, proof. It is, it is a class that is very much proof-based. However, there are two concepts, fundamental primary concepts in geometry that you can never prove. One is a point and one is a line. You can never prove a point and you can never prove a line. All other, all the rest of geometry is built upon those concepts that you have to take for, that you have to pretty much take on faith. Those are the starting points. Those are the, those are the fundamentals that you cannot prove. Well, these, Laws of physics are the basis of the particular theories. You cannot prove the laws of physics. You have to take them as starting points. All right. And so in physics one, we covered two major theories. So in physics one, two major theories. We had the theory of mechanics and the theory of thermal physics. Okay, mechanics is a theory that uh, describes uh, the motion of bodies. Thermal physics, um, um, governs uh, phenomena involving uh, heat, temperature, work, and what we call thermal systems. Now, mechanics is based on four laws of physics. We have um, Newton's first law of motion, Newton's second law Newton's third law and of course the conservation of energy. All of mechanics, any descript description of a body or a system in motion, whether it is um, it, depending on, it, irrespective of the mode of motion, or uh, which would be, or, or the uh, three mo possible modes of motion are, are uh, translation, rotation, and oscillation, or uh, the phases of, of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. New, all of it is fundamentally based upon these, the application of these four fundamental laws. And thermodynamics, we also found that it also is based on four laws. You have the zeroth law of thermodynamics.
the uh, first law, the second law, and the third law of thermodynamics. All thermal phenomena are fundamentally based on these four laws of physics. Why are these four laws of physics true? Nobody knows. They are, they are behaviors in the universe that are always true. They do not have, do not have a more fundamental cause. Okay, and so that is what we covered in the in the 17 chapters of, of uh, physics one. Now, unlike physics one, where I told you on the first day that while well, we're starting from nothing, we're, for, we're starting from scratch, we have nothing. All I can assume is your mathematical background. Well, that's not true in physics two. In physics two, I can actually assume, do you know, all of physics one. Physics one is game. I can completely assume physics one. And so we are, instead of starting in the, around 1500, like I said, year 1500-ish in physics one, we're starting right around 1750, right around there in physics two. So we're at a point where You know, we actually will start seeing the emergence of some American scientists. You know, I mean, every, all the scientists we've talked about so far have been European. Now we have American scientists. Why? Because, well, before America didn't exist. Now it does in our physics chronology, all right? So physics two is going to cover electromagnetic theory. Okay, and then we're going to cover uh, Einstein's uh, special theory of relativity. After that, we'll talk about quantum theory. And then atomic physics. And finally, nuclear physics. All right, so electromagnetic theory uh, is, uh, you know, something that is, uh, you know, uh, very successful and, uh, and of great importance to uh, society, humankind. And we'll find out that electromagnetic theory is fundamentally based on five laws. And so again, we'll talk about these as we as we go along. We have four what are called Maxwell equations, which govern uh, the relationship of, of uh, electric field, magnetic field, space, and time. Again, we'll cover these in in in, in, uh, in part. And then we have uh, a fundamental force law. And I would call it the electromagnetic force law. Now that is a fundamental force law. There are four fundamental forces in the universe. And so we've covered, um, we have covered uh, um, one of them in physics one, and that is, um, and that force is the Newton's law of gravitation. Now we will cover the other three in physics two. And the other three are, um, electromagnetic force, and then the gravitation and electromagnetic force, Newton's law of gravitation, electromagnetic force are the two long range force laws. Then we get to nuclear physics, we'll have the two short range force laws. And that's the strong and weak nuclear force. Now a fundamental force is a force interaction of interaction that is due to some quality or characteristic that a body has. So a body must have some sort of characteristic in order to have uh, an interaction force. And um, so in the case of gravitation, if an object has a mass, it has a force of interaction. In the case of 
electromagnetic, the electromagnetic force, a body has a charge, electric charge, it has interaction. Again, we, we've never discussed electric charge before. That's a new concept. And so now special theory of relativity, now in this case, we start talking about, about the year 1900. So this is about the year 1900 right here. And anything that is 1900 to the present, we refer to that as modern physics. Anything before that is called classical physics. Now, people studying physics back at that time frame did not call it classical physics because it's a comparative purpose, right? I mean, they did not know about modern physics. And so all, all it was just physics. But now we have modern physics where really in modern physics, you're going to see the concept of redefining things and looking at things differently. Special theory of relativity is, is, is uh, you know, Albert Einstein, you know, the great, the great stalwarts of physics, the great top-notch physicists of, the, of, the, of, of existence of whoever lived were Sir Isaac Newton, James Clerk Maxwell, and Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein was the greatest of all of them. And Albert Einstein, as early as 1905, started, started thinking very deeply about, about, about physics and really looking at things differently, not taking anything for granted. And he realized, well, you know, um, you know, one of the questions was, is, is there a limiting speed? I mean, the speed of light, you know, he postulated it to be finite. And if that's the case, then there is, as he postulated, there's nothing faster than the speed of light. Well, Newton's mechanics do not um, take a speed limit into account. In Newton's mechanics, you can have an infinite speed. Well, we know that's not the case, so we have to fix up physics or fix up mechanics to be true for uh, objects moving at high speeds, i.e. A, a good fraction of the speed of light. Newton's mechanics are flat out wrong for physics at high speeds. Then we come, we, we start, toward the end of the uh, 1800s, we started finding uh, phenomena, even though, you know, we had some very successful theories, you know, mechanics, thermal physics, and electromagnetic theory, but we started seeing some phenomena that we flat out just could not understand, that the physics theories at the time were just, were not doing the job. And so, um, that led to the development of quantum theory. Quantum theory took probably about three decades to finally actually develop. I mean, people started needing it and started working on it right around 1900, but it wasn't until about 1927 that we actually had a real good quantum theory. So it took a while. Now, uh, quantum theory is a theory of the very small. Special theory of relativity is the theory of the very fast. So it can be big and fast. Quantum theory, it could be slow, but very, very small. And so something as small, i.e. on the neighborhood of an, of an atom, physics as we know it absolutely fails. And the physics, the world of physics and the quantum level or, or, or in, the, in the very small microscopic or submicroscopic regime is, uh, the, is very, very different than the physics that we know in what we would refer to like this more macroscopic world. Now, the last two are atomic physics and nuclear physics. Well, they're really applications of quantum theory. And so atomic physics is the physics of the atom, as you can imagine. Well, the atom, well, that's the re regime you need to be in to do quantum theory. So, so quantum theory successfully and correctly explains the phenomena and the, and the information of the atom. And then, of course, nuclear, the nucleus of the atom is much, much smaller than the atom itself. An atom is on the order of 10 to the negative 10 meters across, while a nucleus is on the order of 10 to the negative 15 meters across. Much smaller, about 100,000 times smaller than the atom. And so, of course, if, the, if something the size of the atom requires quantum theory, you can only imagine it, something the size of a nucleus would even need quantum theory just as much. All right, so 
electromagnetic theory, you know, that the main electromagnetic theory takes us theory takes us from like chapters 18 through about 24. And then 25, 26, and 27 are going to be um, light or optics. But it turns out, you, you don't see it written here, but it turns out that one of the things that Maxwell showed is that optics and light phenomena are all part of electromagnetic theory. And then we move on to chapter 28, which is the special theory of relativity. Chapter 29 is quantum theory. Chapter 30 is atomic physics. Chapter 31 is nuclear physics. And then we're done with the course. All right, so that's where we're going. All right, so let's talk about chapter 18 now. So with chapter 18, um, we, we have to uh, discuss, well, first of all, we, we go back and, you know, we're right around the year 1750-ish or so, and uh, we start talking about, um, you know, we have our first American scientist, which is Benjamin Franklin. So I can't get another pen here. Okay, um, so Benjamin Franklin, American businessman and, uh, and statesman, Benjamin Franklin, he's on the $100 bill. Benjamin Franklin and others uh, were able to show that the physics uh, governing the spark that leaves your finger when you touch a refrigerator, is the same as that of lightning. Now, it's, it's kind of hard. I mean, we take that for granted today, but it's kind of hard to believe you look at a lightning bolt in a thunderstorm, and yet, um, you know, the, uh, the physics of, you know, of a lightning bolt Compared with, say, um, you know, the spark that you get when you when you shock yourself touching your refrigerator, um, is is really the same physics. You know, you see able to kind of govern that um, uh, kind of uh, behavior. And Franklin is really the person responsible for understanding or begin to understand, you know, that the the charges come in two forms. So Franklin. Um, deemed electric charge as positive and negative. So this nomenclature or this way of looking at charge, you know, has survived to this day. And, and really Benjamin Franklin was the first person to, uh, to uh, think about this. So we start off with, um, you, know, our, our, you know, again, we're studying electricity. We're gonna study electricity, and then we're gonna study magnetism, and then we're gonna realize that they are really two manifestations of the same electromagnetic field. And hence, we'll, we will 
we will have electromagnetism or a full electromagnetic theory by the time we get done with our electric and magnetic studies, all right? So I'll, at the very end, we'll have an electromagnetic theory. Okay, so um, we start off with electricity. So the study of electrical phenomena of objects that are at least temporarily stationary or stationary altogether, oops, stationary, is called electrostatics. All right, the uh, study of electrical phenomena uh, of objects in motion is called electrodynamics all right so right now in in this class we're going to start off with like we would any other uh, study of electromagnetic theory we start off with electrostatics i mean that's where you start off so starting off with electrostatics um, you know, you hear about static electricity. Well, that really is kind of a play on electrostatics. So um, electrostatics governs uh, anything like, you know, uh, uh, laundry clinging together in a washing machine or in a dryer, I should say. So examples of electrostatics. Might be uh, laundry clinging together in a dryer. One of my favorites, and this is one, you know, when I was uh, when I was a kid, uh, there's a lady that a friend of ours who uh, you know set a birthday party, and what she do is you know she would be blowing up a bunch of balloons and as she walked around she'd be blowing up balloons and then she would rub the balloon against her hair and then stick the balloon on the wall and then she'd rub her hair stick it on the wall rub her hair and i, I, and I was absolutely mesmerized watching this i was I, I had no idea you could do that and you know and so what she was doing is rubbing electron electrons off the balloon off the rubber in the balloon and causing there to be an excess charge on the balloon, which was causing electrostatic attraction to the wall. And so again, that's another electrostatic problem. So, you know, rubbing uh, another example would be rubbing a balloon on your hair and sticking it on a wall. So I was, um, I found that I found that to be amazing. You know, now I understand it, but you know, when you're a, when you're a kid, you're just mesmerized by watching this lady do this stuff. I mean, I, I mean, at least I was. I guess maybe I could attribute her to maybe some of my early interests in physics. But anyway, um, so. The thing about electromagnetic theory is in order to participate, for, in order for a body to participate in electromagnetic theory, it has to have a special property. 
called the electric charge. So in order for a body to participate in electromagnetic theory, It must possess an electric charge. Now, we've gone the entirety of physics one without ever having to talk about electric charge. Electric charge is something that is totally brand new to our studies. And so it is fundamental in, um, in what we're going to talk about in, in, uh, in physics uh, two. But again, you absolutely do not need the concept of electric charge whatsoever in physics one. This is totally new. But if an object doesn't have electric charge, it does not play. So if you take like a neutron, for instance, chargeless uh, su uh, subatomic particle. Neutron knows nothing about electromagnetic theory. It does not participate. The proton, which is a positive, is positively charged, electron negatively charged, it does participate. But again, um, you have to, you have to uh, have a, what's called electric charge. So this, um, so this brings up an experiment, a simple experiment that'll tell us a lot. So the experiment is the following. As simple as this, you rub, so you get, um, So you rub um, a glass rod with a silk cloth. All right, you find that both glass rod and the silk cloth are electrically charged. All right, so you know, again, we're, we're, we're literally just getting started, so we don't really know what's going on yet, all right? But we, we, can, we can look at some, some observations. So two such glass rods, if we, if we have, let's say we do this experiment, we have, we have one glass rod, one silk cloth, we do it with another glass rod and another silk cloth, two such glass rods, uh feel a force of repulsion they repel each other two such so clocks feel a force of repulsion. However, um, a glass rod and a silk cloth feel a force of attraction. Okay, so again, you've done this experiment. All you've done is you have rubbed the silk cloth on a glass rod, and you find out that they are charged. They are charged, and in fact, they experience forces of interaction with one another. And you look, you see, oh, two such glass rods. I prepare this way. They feel a repulsive force. Two such silk cloths. 
prepare this way feel also feel a repulsion force. However, the glass rod and silk cloth feel a force of attraction. Very simple experiment, but we learn a lot from this experiment. Okay, so what do we learn just from these observations? So from these observations, so from this experiment, We learn. Um, there are two types of charge. Now you can call them whatever you want. Franklin called them positive and negative. So Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, uh, deemed the charges to be positive and negative. Now we could have called them up or down. I mean, we could have called them anything, but you know, this is actually a very useful um, way of looking at it. And it turns out that we use that concept today, but Clearly, the glass rod had one charge. Actually, we will find out that it is positively charged. And the silk cloth has another flavor of charge. And we, we will understand it is negatively charged. All right. So that's one thing, two types of charge. Another thing that we can understand is that like charges repel. Unlike charges. attract so when i say like charges repel well that would mean if i have a positive with the positive they will experience a repulsion a force of repulsion and likewise uh, a negative and a negative will also feel a force of repulsion okay whoops Showing this right over here. All right, so a positive charge and a positive charge will feel a force of repulsion, mutual repulsion. A negative charge and a negative charge, same thing. They will feel the force of mutual repulsion. All right. And then we would say the unlike charges attract. So a plus and a minus attract one another. They have a mutual attraction. Okay. And then we also know that there is charged particles feel a force of interaction. I mean, all of these things that we learn from this simple experiment, experiment. Very simple experiment, but it tells us a lot. All right, so that simple experiment tells us there are two types of charges. Benjamin Franklin uh, deemed them as positive and negative, like charges repel, unlike charges attract, and charged particles feel a force of interaction. So there's a force involved. That means that a charge would accelerate based upon that force by Newton's second law. It is a force given by Newton's. All right, now, another thing to keep in mind is that, um, you know, I'm going to kind of rush ahead briefly to atomic physics uh, to, but we're, well, let's kind of talk about, I mean, it just kind of gives me a, a rationale for what I'm, what I'm about to say, but, you know, we, when our, in our more advanced studies, 
we're going to realize that fundamentally um, there are charged particles in that reside in in the atom itself so we go back and then again i'm hoping that all of you come with this uh prerequisite knowledge or or this knowledge before coming to this class maybe from classes in high school or your chemistry class but if you look at an atom an atom has a positively charged nucleus and around it so again this is overall possibly charged if you will and around it are negatively charged electrons that go that go around the nucleus there's an electron maybe here's another electron and they're negatively charged now this is an atom all right and so coming into into this class you know you you have an idea of what the atom looks like you know again there's a, a positively charged nucleus and around it is a negatively negatively charged electrons now it turns out that an electron has a, a charge well so first of all it turns it turns out that all charges all charged objects uh have a charge that is an integral multiple of a fundamental charge a fundamental electric charge q sub e charges are usually given by by a little by by the letter q and the e stands for let's say electron and that charge is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs all right the coulomb we'll write it out the first time the coulomb is named after charles coulomb the french physicist charles coulomb and um for the experiments then we'll talk about him in a moment uh but essentially what am i saying here is that any charged object say capital q as i said it's going to be some number n times a q sub e n is an integer or n is a positive integer or a or at least i'll say non-negative integer Zero, one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. Ten thousand, seven million, four hundred eighty-eight. Whatever. I mean, it, it, it's a it's a number that if you break it down, any charge that you ever encounter in the universe is going to be some multiple of this fundamental charge. Actually, I am incorrect about that. It is any integer. It could be negative as well. Sorry, it's an integer. So it could, be, it could be negative, like in the case of electron. All right. So n is an integer. Could be a negative number as well but it's an integer now what's interesting here is that the electron has a charge of negative q sub e and a proton has a charge of positive q sub e now we haven't talked about electrons and protons in this class yet and we will but you know these are fundamental charges you don't get you know anything smaller than this this is kind of like the penny if you will and and when you're talking about money you know i i can give you any amount of i can talk about any amount of money but it effectively is you can effectively express it in in terms of pennies if i give you a dollar you really are telling i'm really giving a hundred a hundred pennies or i'm giving you ten dollars i'm giving you a thousand pennies at some point Whatever I whatever I give you can be expressed fundamentally in terms of pennies. I cannot, it makes no sense to talk about a fraction of a penny. I can't tell you, 
that something's going to be 0.35 cents. Doesn't make any sense. The penny is the fundamental unit of, of our money. Well, the electric charge, the fundamental electric charge Q sub E is the fundamental charge of anything that you, that you experience, any charged object. Okay, now it turns out, well, so, so, well, first of all, let's, well, it turns out that the electron, and again, this is going into advanced physics, but the electron, it looks for all uh, intents and purposes as a fundamental particle. You can't break it down to anything smaller, but the baryons, like, a, like protons and neutrons, for instance, are actually composed of things, are sub, uh, subatomic particles that are smaller than it. And they're called quarks. So let's uh, talk about that briefly. Again, this is going in, into, uh, this would actually go into chapter 32 type stuff, which we're not going to get to. But again, it's nice to, to, to have a little bit of a understanding of, of, of this. So an electron is a basic fundamental particle with no substructure. A proton and neutron, for instance, are composed or do, are, we'll say a proton and a neutron have substructures. Composed of quarks. Now it turns out that there are three sets of quarks. I so will talk about them in a moment, but the one that is that comprises all known matter are the up and down quark. So the up and down quark comprise all known matter, naturally occurring matter, all right? Uh, the up quark, now this is gonna be what's gonna, this, this is gonna be the funny part about this, the up quark, which we call U, has a charge of positive two thirds E. So again, as I just said, there's no such thing as a fractional charge. Well, the quarks do have it positive two thirds Q sub E. The down quark typically called little d has a charge of negative one third Q sub E. So you can form a proton around here. So you got this. Now, so what that means is that you can form a proton with two ups and a down. So pro baryons are composed of generally three quarks. So a proton can be composed of an up, up, down, and a neutron can be composed of an up, down, down. So protons, two ups and a down, neutrons, two, uh, one up and two downs. How does this work out uh, charge-wise? Well, let's see, an up is positive two thirds Q sub E and a down is negative one third. So what would be the charge of a proton with this model? Well, we'd have two thirds Q sub E plus two thirds Q sub E minus one third Q sub E is positive one Q sub E. Well, yeah, that's the charge of a proton, positive one. That works out. What about the neutron? Two thirds Q sub E minus one third Q sub E minus one third Q sub E 
equals zero. That's the charge of a proton. So charge wise, it works out. So again, but those are the quarks. We cannot actually ever uh, directly experience a quark because the more we pull on a quark, the more it pulls back. It does not want to leave a proton or a neutron. It wants to stay there. It's, it's, it sticks like glue. And so unlike other, uh, other particles we can extract, the harder we try to extract a quark, the more it pulls back in us. So it's really a losing proposition to try to do so. Uh, but other than that, the, the takeaway is any kind of, any kind of um, uh, matter, uh, any, any kind of uh, naturally occurring charged particles are going to be integral multiples of Q sub E. Now, I talked about the up and down quark just for completion. We have uh, two other sets of quarks in the universe. We only see them in, let's say, uh, a particle, particle uh, uh, accelerator reactions, for instance. So we have the up and down. There, they, they go together. We have the charm quark and the strange quark. They go together as a pair, and we have the top and the bottom. Those are heavy quarks. Top is a little T and the bottom is a B. Now, we have to have uh, particle accelerator reactions to see these other kind of quarks. And in fact, um, when we had, you know, we had the Large Hadron Collider, you hear about that in Big Bang Theory probably, but Large Hadron Collider, and we were supposed to have the superconducting super collider in Texas, but unfortunately um, our government um, didn't feel that it was necessary to be the, uh, top of the world in physics, I guess. So, so that never went through. And so instead, uh, we, the, the fundamental physics is being done in uh, Switzerland and, and uh, France. So the Large Hadron Collider is a giant particle accelerator that accelerates protons. And part of the accelerator is in France and part of it's in Switzerland. And so the accelerator accelerates protons and the thing about it is when you're trying to understand fundamental particles, really small particles, the way to do it is to smash them, smash particles together and see what the parts are. It's kind of like if I want to understand what goes inside, what, you know, what, if I have an alarm clock and I want to understand you know, what it looks like or what it's make it made of, I'll just, I'll just sit there and I'll smash it on the ground as hard as I can and look at the pieces. It's kind of the same kind of concept. So you, to have the smaller particles, you need to have more energy. They need to be smashed together harder, all right? And so you really have to accelerate these particles. These are protons that are accelerated and they smash together. Well, before the Large Hadron Collider went into effect, a number of lawsuits uh, went against it. One lawsuit, you know, there, you know, various people were worried and actually understandably so about uh, some negative uh, side effects that the Large Hadron Collider may produce. Uh, one of the side effects were little black holes. Yes, indeed, uh, the, these, uh, these particles and they smash into each other do create very small black holes. Yes, black holes that you, that you hear about that suck up everything, you know, uh, uh, even light. Well, little black holes, but however, these black holes are dissipated fairly quickly with what's called Hawking radiation, named after, you know, it was one of the, great uh, discoveries by Stephen Hawking, Hawking radiation, where black holes actually dissipate and get weaker over time. These are very small black holes, but indeed they are created in their lawsuits, uh, trying to stop large hadron clutter because they're worried about little black holes. Uh, the other, uh, one of the other lawsuits was uh, a worry about what's called strange matter. Now, we have not had strange matter in our universe for, I would say billions of years. Um, really, the, the universe is composed, at least for, as far as we understand, composed primarily of matter that is, uh, that is composed, uh, comprised of uh, up and down quarks. Now, if you look at the periodic table, just in the 92 naturally occurring elements that we see, there's such an incredible diversity of behaviors of the elements. You need to take a look at, say, hydrogen and, 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 and oxygen. These are two elements that are highly flammable. 
Yeah, you put them together to make water, you put out fire. And so there's incredible diversity of, of behaviors just in the 92 naturally occurring elements that are up and down quark based. What in the world would strange matter be like? What would that do to our world? What consequences? You know, so, you know, those are, those are good questions. And um, yeah, I mean, all strange matter does get created by uh, particle accelerators. We do see these other kind of quarks. There's a reason why we, have, we understand them because we see them. And it turns out that lawsuit was explained away as well. And scientists, uh, I guess, put everybody at ease about the creation of strange matter. But anyway, you know, these are the other quarks. And but the ones that are most important to us would be up and down. Now, I'm not going to talk any more about quarks this semester. But again, you know, we're talking about charges, we're talking about fundamental particles. We ought to have a little tiny discussion about uh, how fundamental are these fundamental particles? What are the true fundamental particles? And they'd be the quarks, all right? So I'm going to leave this little brief mini discussion of quarks, and we'll go back to the mundane discussion of charges. Now, the charge, again, the S, as I said, the SI unit, we do everything in SI. Remember, SI means system. So remember, um, remember what SI means. It, it is the metric system, or um, it is French, le système. International. Otherwise known as a metric system. So again, you know, this is based upon meters as the length. The mass would be the base is kilograms. I guess I'll write it out first time. And the time unit would be the second. Again, those of you who've had me in physics one are very ver or well versed in this in this system. Uh, if you if you hadn't had physics for a while, I would look up the metric system or look up SI. Again, you you want to be you, you want to be conversant with that. And so I don't. So eleven of you, I know where you come. Out of the twenty four students, eleven of you, I know I know where you come from because I've had because you had me in physics one. The other thirteen of you, I don't know where, where you've come from. So depending upon your background in physics one, again, you want to be familiar with the system. All right. And so you know, the force units, the Newton, the energy units, the joule, so on and so forth, right? Well, the SI unit for electric charge is the Coulomb, as I've said. And you typically use a capital C to talk about the Coulomb, all right? Now, one Coulomb is actually a large charge. How, how, I, how will I express that? Well, let's see how many, see how many, elect, how many protons are needed to make, to make one Coulomb a charge. So 1.0 Coulomb, all right, of charge. Now I wanna find out how many protons. So I'm gonna do a little conversion factor and multiply one proton has 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Again, that's the fundamental electric charge. And it turns out when I do that calculation, I need 6.25 times 10 to the 18 protons. I mean, that is a lot of protons. 10 to the 18th is one, is a one with 18 zeros after it. Okay, so 6.25 times 10 to the 18 protons are required for 1.0 coulombs of electric charge. So a coulomb is a large charge. But that is our fundamental SI unit. So when you work out physics problems in electromagnetic theory, you want to use coulombs, not microcoulombs, not nanocoulombs. You want to convert those to coulombs. All right, and so one coulomb in and of itself is a very large charge, as I said. Now, um, now the thing is, what we want to do is talk about how do we get a charge? How do we go about obtaining charges? You now, we clearly know about charges, but how, how, do we, um, how do we obtain them? So we separate them out. 
How do we do that? Well, there's various ways of doing it. So I can separate charges. So how to separate charges? One way is rubbing. So again, I've given, I gave, a, I gave a couple of examples of, of rubbing. I, I gave an example of, you know, a, a silk cloth rubbed against a glass rod. And I also gave an example of the lady I, I, I watched uh, at a birthday party one time, uh, essentially making, uh, you know, sticking balloons on, on the wall by, um, by uh, rubbing uh, the balloon against her hair. So if I, if I rub, if I rub, so rubbing a glass rod by a silk cloth rubs, or ex I would say extracts, some electrons off of the glass rod. Leaving the glass rod to be positive, to be possibly charged. And the silk cloth to be negatively charged. Now, what do I mean by positively charged and negatively charged? I mean, what is meant by that? And so, well, there are a lot of charges in a given body. So, you know, say the glass rod is gonna have a lot of protons and a lot of electrons. When it is neutral, the number of electrons and the number of protons will equal each other. When you have, when you extract a few electrons off of the glass rod, what you, what you have is a residual um, charge. You have, you, have an, you, you, you have some sort of a, of a charge difference. So now that you've extracted some electrons off the glass rod, the glass rod now has more positive charges than negative charges. So it makes it effectively positively charged. The glass rod, I'm sorry, the silk cloth in her hand has a few more negative charges. And so it has more negative charges now than positive charges. So it makes it effectively negatively charged. When an object is charged, it does not require very many charges to make that happen. Electric force is very powerful. When you see a thunder, a thunderclap, I mean, one of the things that nature wants to do is to have electrostatic equilibrium. You want, you want to have charge neutrality. And so, you know, um, nature doesn't really like charged objects per se or charged bodies. So you look at a thunderstorm, for instance. Well, when there's too much charge difference between, let's say, a cloud and the ground, at some point, you're going to have electrostatic breakdown. You're going to have a lightning strike. You know, the, you know, in a lightning strike, the purpose of it is to balance out charge. The cloud is too charged. The cloud and the ground are too out of whack. They have too much of a charge difference. Nature has a lightning strike in order to be able to equalize that. That's the point of a lightning strike. Or that's the point. I mean, you, you always want to try to equalize charge. You, nature prefers charge neutrality. Okay. So rubbing is one way of making of, of, of making objects charged. Um, another way is you look at batteries. The batteries use a chemical reaction. So in batteries, a, chem 
chemical reaction. Causes one terminal to be positive and the other negative, which you need for a battery. We'll talk more about this as we proceed in our studies. So again, another way of causing uh, charge separation. Okay, so so chemical reaction is, is, is a way. Now, the thing that's to keep in mind here, which is very important, is that charge cannot be created or destroyed. All right, so no charges are ever created or destroyed. Um, in any charge separation process. All right, um, rather existing charges are just moved about. This is due to a conservation law, to the conservation of, of, of charge. So we have a new conservation law. Okay, this is a conservation law that must always be obeyed in any physics reaction. So law of conservation of charge. What is it? It essentially says the total charge is constant in any process. Total charge before a reaction equals the total charge after the reaction. So the total charge is constant in any process. Very simple statement. No physical reaction will ever occur that violates this conservation of charge process. None has ever been seen. Nature seems to go out of its way to make sure that charge conservation is always adhered to, even in exotic situations. So for instance, let's say you have a nuclear reaction. So charge conservation, or conservation of charge, is always obeyed. So even in uh, so even in um, exotic situations, like nuclear reactions. If a product particle is charged, there will always be
a product particle with an opposite charge. Often, oftentimes, an antimatter partner You know, we'll, we'll uh, see this in beta decay. You know, beta decay must be accompanied by what are called, elect what are called neutrinos. Neutrinos are exotic particles, but they are required in order, to, in order to actually have conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, and conservation of charge. You know, we did not initially know about neutrinos, and so when we're studying, we're studying nuclear reactions, Either three major conservation principles are being simultaneously violated, or there must be some other particle that, that's being created we, we have to detect that is allowing the conser these conservation principles to, to, uh, to, uh, uh, be, uh, to, to be adhered to. And turns out, of course, we, you know, that's where the neutrino came into play. You know, we'll, we'll talk about that in, uh, in the conservation of, uh, or, sorry, we'll talk about that in nuclear physics back in, you know, toward the end of the semester in chapter, chapter 31. Okay, so again, physics is, there's never a, um, a, um, an example ever of, of a of, uh, conservation charge being violated. Conservation principles are always adhered to. All right, let's uh, work a problem. Now, I want to, have a small aside before we do that. So um, the textbook for this course, okay? So the textbook for this course, and then, you know, anybody's had me before, this is no surprise. is physics by, so that's the title of the book, physics by Cutnell and Johnson, 11th edition. Okay, that's the book. So you will get all of your problems from this book. Now, once in a while, I will work a problem, I will work a problem out from the book. And when I do that, I will always Started it off with what's called CJ for Cutnell and Johnson. So CJ and then problem number CJ means that I'm I'm looking at a problem out of Cutnell and Johnson, out of your textbook. You have to have the textbook for the class. Uh, the textbook is expensive. So anybody who's had it for physics one owns the textbook. Well, we're using that same textbook. For those of you who who had who did not have physics one here at TCC, uh, you're going to need to buy this book. And there's no free copy. Uh, the textbook that this class, uh, when I first started teaching this class back in 2017, the textbook that we had was OpenStax. So the old textbook is OpenStax, College Physics. by Rice University out in Houston. Now, this book, in my opinion, is superior to the Cotton Old Johnson book. Now, the thing is, I will, I will work 
many OpenStax problems in my lectures. And again, anybody who's had under physics one uh, knows this. Um, again, but let's let's keep in mind here that I am not going to assign anything out of there and out of that. And, and in fact, um, you can get, you can download. And I'll, I'll actually send you an email here soon uh, to allow you to do this. But you can download uh, this book for free. as a PDF. So you have a superior book you can get for free, but we now use a not so good book that you have to pay $150 for. So I, I, I didn't make the decision, but anyway, that's uh, that's what I do. And, and so and so I will work a lot of problems out of this book. This book, is, I mean, again, you're, you, all of you are in this class because you're a scientist or you're gonna become scientists. So one of the things scientists do is research, and so you don't want, you don't want to be the reader of one book. You want to have multiple books. So again, when I do a problem with OpenStax, I always put an OS in front. OpenStax, OpenStax problem number. You'll see that. So it's a little aside. You know, when I work problems out, that's what that's what that means. All right. So let me work my first problem of the semester here. And I'm going to look at OpenStax 18.1. No, oh, one more thing I want to talk about. I talked about this in the um, in the file that contains all the problems, but I have a nomenclature that I, I adhere to in this class. So I refer to problem numbers as I refer to problems as problem number dot. Oh, I'm sorry. Incorrect. Start again. Chapter number dot problem. So for instance, um, for example, problem three out of chapter uh, 19 is what chapter number? I would call it 19 dot problem number three. All right, so we have 31 chapters we're gonna cover, we cover in this class, you know, 17, the first 17 in physics one, and the uh, last, uh, and then chapters 18 through 31 in physics two, and there's actually a chapter 32 in this textbook. So there are 32 versions of problem three. What problem three are we talking about? Well, this nomenclature allows me to uh, to eliminate any kind of ambiguity and know exactly what, what problem three I'm talking about. I'm talking about problem three out of chapter 19. Okay, so again, that's the nomenclature I use in this class. I specifically discuss the chapter number dot problem number. All right, so when you do your problems, I want you to do the same thing. Again, anybody who's having in physics one, it is a uh, I've trained you well, um, so the new students, we, I want you guys to do the same thing as the, as the uh, students have had before. All right, um, so with that said, I'm gonna work out OpenStax 18.1. That means it's inside of OpenStax. You go to chapter 18, problem one. So chapter 18 in OpenStax is also electric force, electric charge, just like chapter 18 in Cottonell Johnson. Sometimes the chapter numbers are off. Most of the time they're lined up. So right now, OpenStax uh, started Physics 2 at chapter 18. Well, so does Cottonell and Johnson, all right? So we're, so, but, so what does chapter 18, problem one look like? What is it? So common static electricity Involves charges of 
ranging from micro nanocoulombs to microcoulomb. And it's a good example to use our prefixes, nano, micro, so on and so forth. All right, A. How many electrons are needed to form a charge of negative 2.00 nanocoulomb? Okay, uh, B. How many electrons must be removed? <clears throat> From a neutral object, to leave a net charge of 0 0.500 microcoulomb. So remember this mu, we use the Greek alphabet. This is the Greek M. It is mu, like the like a kitty cat. So mu is the Greek little M. So when you put mu in front of uh, something, it's micro, 10 to the negative six. All right. So again, if, if you're not familiar with that, we have I one of the one of the uh, uh, documents I put on Blackboard as a unit conversions document. So it helps you remind yourself of the unit conversions. All right. So here we go. So common static electricity involves charges ranging from nanocoulombs to microcoulombs. A, how many electrons are needed to form a charge of negative 2.0 or nanocoulombs? And B, how many electrons must be removed from a neutral object to leave a net charge of 0 0.500 microcoulombs? All right. And so again, um, I have to erase the I have to, well, I have to erase the problem for real estate purposes and confined to a single whiteboard in this uh online class all right so um the first thing i want to do is i have i have a, a i want to make a charge with electrons of negative 2.00 nanocoulombs now again i want to go to, to the base si unit nanocoulombs is not going to do me any good i need to express that in terms of coulombs so it's going to be negative 2.00 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs that's the nanocoulombs Nano means billionth. So negative 2.0 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs. And then I know that an electron has uh, negatives, negative two, negatively charged, negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Coulombs will cancel. And what I'm left with is 1.25. times 10 to the 10th electrons. That's how many electrons it takes to make a charge of negative 2.00 or negative 2.00 nanocoulombs. That's part A. Part B. Let's think about this for a moment. Um, we we, we uh, have an, a neutral object that's gonna have a charge a positive 0 0.500 microcoulombs. We, don't know, we want to know how many electrons are removed to make this happen. Well, again, if the charge is neutral, it's going to have as many positive charges as negative charges. When you start taking away negative charges, like electrons, you make the object positive. 
So given that the object has a positive, the overall object has a positive 0.500 microcoulomb charge, that means you had to have removed that equal amount or equal uh, charge in electrons. All right, and so um, let's see. Yes, negative 0 0.500. Micro is 10 to the negative six coulombs. All right. Um, and of course, one coulomb or one electron, again, is one as negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And again, coulombs cancel, and you get 3.13. times 10 to the 13th electron. So again, there's a lot of electrons in the universe, a lot of electrons at play in even the most basic charges. All right, first problem of the semester. All right, I wanna now do OpenStax 18.3. All right, so this says to start a car engine, the car battery um, moves. 3.75 to the 10 to the 21st electron. Uh, through the starter motor. All right, how many coulombs of charge were moved? It was kind of a little bit of opposite of the previous problem. In the previous problem, we started with charge and um, ended up with number of electrons. Now we're starting off with number of electrons and, and, and wanting to go and figure out what the co what the corresponding charge is, right? So um, start a car engine, the car battery moves. Huge amount of electrons, 3.75 to the 21st electrons. Through the starter motor, how many coulombs of charge were moved? Well, probably you normally have a real estate problem, but this is a pretty short problem. So um, what we have here is, 3.75 times 10 to the 21st electrons. Now, um, we want to go to we want to go to charge. So we have um, we have negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs per electron. And when you do that, you find out that you have the charge is negative 600 coulombs. That is a huge charge. Even a coulomb is a large charge. 600 coulombs is a crazy large charge that you know is going through to start your car. You know the you know, what comes out of the battery into the motor. All right, so negative 600 coulombs. Okay. Um, the next topic so again we're we fundamentally discussed charge, electric charge and electrons and protons and again we're not we're not talking about atomic physics yet but we have to kind of talk a little bit about the constituents of charge um the next thing we're talking about is conductors and insulators we say a lot about conductors in this in this lecture all right so um, some substances uh, 
um, such as metals and salt water. Allow uh, charges to move through them with relative ease. Uh, we call such substances conductors. So a conductor is a body or a, or a material that allows easy passage of, of electrons. Uh, oftentimes, or usually, conductors are composed of atoms which have one or two loosely bound valence electrons. Which can easily made to be free. Free charge moves about, free to move about. All right, so again, uh, conductors, um, the atoms are such that, you know, now a valence electron are the, again, this, we'll talk about this more in uh, atomic physics, but valence electrons are electrons that are in the outermost shells. They're the, you know, as you build up um, the electrons in, a, in an atom, they're the ones that are furthest away. They're the ones that actually will interact with it and, do, and, and uh, perform the chemistry. All right, and so again, uh, you know, these, these atoms are in the, in the metals, they're in the far left of the periodic table usually, and, they're, and they have no problem whatsoever giving up electrons. So again, that's the, and that's the, uh, that's the uh, typical atoms that are, that are in metals. So, you know, what are, you know, you know we have anything that's a metal, like, you know, uh, uh, copper, zinc, nickel, silver, gold, and any kind of metal is a very, very good uh, conductor, salt water. You know, again, sodium and chlorine separate, they dissociate in water very quickly, forming ions. Anytime you have a lot of ions around, uh, you have you you have uh, a lot of charge, a lot of charges, a lot of available charges, uh, and easy um, that are you know, that allow easy uh, conduction of electricity. All right. Um, now, on the other hand, uh, substances that do not allow free passes of, of uh, electrons would be called insulators, right? So it's the opposite. So substances substances such as glass, rubber, and pure water that do not allow easy passage of electrons are called Conductor, I'm oh, sorry, insulators. All right, so 
They do not allow the easy pass electrons. They're called insulators. Um, essentially, atoms that comprise insulators are, well, let's put it this way, insulators are composed of atoms whose valence electrons are tightly bound. So bound meaning meaning tied. So tightly bound to, to the atom. All right, and so again, you're not going to have uh, free movement of of electrons that way. So, so you have you have um, you have conductors and insulators. Okay, so now we want we we talk about charged objects, but the question is, how do you charge an object? What are what are methods of charging an object? So, um, one. So again, how do we charge? How do we how do we charge or how do we create charged objects? Well, one way to do it, and I'm going to show you some pictures of this from the OpenStax book, but one way to do it is called charging by contact. All right, so let me uh, share my um, open snacks with you. Give me a moment though. I don't I don't actually have it up yet. So one moment. <clears throat> Bring it up right now. And I'll email you uh, a link to this textbook shortly. People who took me for physics uh, one should actually have a link to this, especially the ones that took me last summer. All right, give me a moment. I'm almost there. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna look at uh, some pictures together. All right, and so in this picture, you know, if you look in the, on the, you know, there's three, you, know, you see three pictures side by side. Um, what you, um, what you see, uh, this object that you see here is called an electroscope. Electroscope is made out of a conductor. All right, and so electroscope was originally electrically neutral. That means that the number of electrons, number of protons in the electroscope were balanced, they're the same. Now, I prepare a positively charged glass rod that you see up here, glass rod, positively charged, I rubbed it with silk. And so when you see the glass rod approaching the, um, the electroscope, you'll start seeing uh, negative charges being drawn upward uh, toward the glass rod. Negative charges are being attracted to the positively charged glass rod. 
what happens then is you see a, it's called electrical polarization. You see that there are that you see positive charges being left on these leaves, these leaves here in inside the electroscope. And so you see a, a charge imbalance where you see um, the electric the electrons are uh, charged are free to move about. And so you see there's a reason for there to be a concentration of negative charge in that upper metal ball part of the electroscope. Now, in order for charges to leave the glass rod, because the glass rod is an insulator, in order for charges to leave, we're, I'm looking at the middle picture now, the glass rod actually has to touch the electroscope. Um, they're at, and that's called, that's where you have the word contact, where the, the, the glass rod uh, makes contact with the electroscope. And that's the way that charges get transferred from the electroscope to the glass rod. Now, you know, you, uh, assuming enough charges are transferred to the glass rod, where the glass rod is neutral, the glass rod is pulled away. And then you see the uh, rightmost picture. And what's left is you have an electroscope that is now charged. It has an over, because it lost electrons to the glass rod, it is now, uh, it, all, it now has an overall negative, uh, sorry, overall positive charges. So there is a, an, um, an overall uh, positive charge electroscope and uh, it's because of the charge by contact. So you now have created a charged object via the method of charge by contact. All right, so let me uh, write down kind of what I just said here. All right, and so we have charged by contact. What, um, what happened? Let me kind of describe in words what we just saw in pictures. All right, so again, charge, charging by contact. Contact meaning touch. <laughs> All right, so what happened? Well, originally, we have a neutral uh, metallic conducting electroscope. Now, again, if it's a metal, it's a conductor, so it's a little bit of uh, um, extra verbiage here but i'm trying to i'm trying to be uh i'm trying to be deliberate so a metallic conducting electroscope all right um a positively charged glass rod is brought near the electroscope drawing or attracting i should say electrons toward it Okay, now since the since the um, glass rod is a uh, insulator, it must actually touch. Hence the word contact, the electroscope in order for charges to be transferred to it. So in, uh, for charges to be transferred, from the electroscope
to the glass rod. Okay, so, so far, what, what are we seeing here? We're right now into the middle picture that we saw out of the three pictures. So originally we have a neutral metallic ele conducting electroscope. We didn't see that picture, you know, before anything started, it was neutral. A positively charged glass rod is brought near the electroscope attracting electrons toward it. Charges in the electroscope move easily because the electroscope is a, is a conductor. Since the glass rod is an insulator, it must actually touch or contact the electroscope in order for charges to be transferred from the electroscope to the glass rod. You actually have to have contact in order for this to happen. Now, we'll assume enough charges have been, have been uh, transferred to the, to the glass rod to make it neutral. Now we'll pull the glass rod away. So, assuming enough Electrons have been transferred to the glass rod. To make it neutral, glass rod is pulled away. Leaving the electroscope with a net positive charge. And so again, uh, they say pictures are the thousand words. We wrote a whole bunch of words out to describe the three pictures that we just got done seeing. But again, that's that's what's happening. That's charging by contact. We also have another method of charging, and that's called charging by induction. Okay, that's another method. So let's uh, go back to the uh, textbook and discuss that. So we'll uh, momentarily share my screen. Give me a moment to get over there. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen now and we'll see another set of pictures. And I'll talk through them and I'll give a little, uh, discussion of what we just saw as well. So again, to share the screen again. All right, so what you'll see is another set of pictures. Here we see a couple of metallic spheres. Now again, they're metallic, so they're conductors, but they are neutral in picture A. They're neutral, nothing's going on. You have uh, the number of protons and electrons are equal and they are distributed so that the overall net charge of these metallic spheres is, is, uh, the, is zero. And these spheres are touching. So these two spheres are touching, they're insulated from the rest of the world. So there's nothing's happening, you know, let's say in the bottom. Now, in picture B, what we see is that a, gla a positive charged glass rod, again, the same kind of same kind of prepared glass rod in a previous example approaches the spheres. Now what happens is, uh, you know, again, charge can be uh, moved about easily. So the, um, the left sp sphere has negative charges that are attracted to it. And it causes a polarization where the right sphere has an overall positive uh, net charge. All right, and so again, the, that's the right sphere is probably positively charged because it's losing electrons from you know uh, that are that are being attracted over to the uh, to the to the glass rod. 
Now with the glass rod in place, I'm looking at picture C now, with the glass rod in place, we're gonna now separate the spheres. And the spheres will have a maintained, or they will still have uh, overall, uh, the left, left sphere will have an overall, uh, overall net, uh, net negative charge, and the right sphere will have an overall net positive charge. And then we take the glass rod away. And we see that in, in uh, picture D that we have charged spheres. The left, the left sphere uh, continues to be, uh, have a, a net negative charge. The right sphere continues to have a net positive charge. Now, keep in mind here that the rod, the glass rod never made contact with the spheres. There's no touching involved. This process is called charging by induction. All right, so let me, let me put this in words, what I just said. All right, charging by induction. Let's, let's put this now in words. So we have, so originally we have two, uh, neutral metallic conducting spheres. Again, a lot of extra words here, but I want to be deliberate. That are placed side by side and touching or and in contact but insulated from the rest of the world yeah that's that would be oops that would be picture A that you saw. Okay. Then we bring the glass rod. So we so we approach the metallic spheres. with a positively charged glass rod. Charged polarization occurs where and I'm going back to my picture, the left sphere has a net negative charge and the right sphere a net positive charge. Okay, yeah, so again, rereading this, originally we have two neutral metallic conducting spheres that are placed side by side and in contact, but insulated from the rest of the world. We approach the metallic spheres with a positively charged glass rod. Charged polarization occurs where the left sphere has a net negative charge and the, and, and the uh, right sphere a net positive charge. I forgot the word right. Uh, 
that were in net positive charge, okay? That would be picture B. Now, what do we do? While holding the positively charged glass rod in place, glass rod in place, we separate the metallic conducting spheres. Which remain charged in the manner as in the in the uh, same way, same manner as before. Finally, we pull away. The positively charged glass rod leaving the left sphere uh, with a net negative charge. And the right sphere with a net positive charge. Okay, so that is what we saw. The glass rod is gone, and now we have two charged. Uh, conductors. Now I'm going to point on a couple of things real quickly, and that's the whole process. But I want to point out two things. One is the glass rod. I already pointed this out, but the uh, let's see, the positively charged glass rod. Never made contact with the metallic spheres. If it had, then we'd be talking about charged by contact. Okay, this charge, there's no touching involved. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind here, which is interesting, is let's say after the fact, afterward, if we put the charged conducting metallic spheres, Back in contact and it's or in there or in the original configuration. Charge will be distributed. charge would quickly distribute
so that they are again neutral. uncharged. So again, if you want to go on and put them back the way they were before, you can put them back in contact and they and the charge will be charge will be distributed accordingly and the uh the conducting spheres will again become neutral. Okay, and that's something that's important to consider. You know, some of the problems you're going to be working in cutting on Johnson are going to require you to understand that. All right. Okay. Um let me uh, now discuss, let me look, look at a couple of problems. All right. I want to talk about uh, cutting on Johnson 18.5. I'm sorry, not cutting on Johnson, open stacks, sorry. Open stacks, 18.5. All right, suppose a speck of dust in an electrostatic precipitator has 1.0000 times 10 to the 12 proton. In it, and has a net charge of <clears throat> negative 5.00 nanocoulomb. All right. A very large charge for a little spec. How many electrons does it have? All right, Cottonwood Johnson, 18.5. Suppose a speck of dust in electrostatic precipitator has 1.0000 times 10 to the 12 protons in it and has a Net charge of negative 5.00 nanocoulomb. So a very large charge for a little speck. How many electrons does it have? Okay, so let's kind of think about, first of all, this speck of dust in a neutral sense. If the speck of dust was neutral, that means it would have 1.0000 times 10 to the 12 protons. And 1.0000 times 10 to the 12th electrons. It would balance out. However, it has a net negative 5.00 nanocoulomb charge. That means that the number of electrons must exceed the number of, of protons. That means you have to have an extra number of electrons to account for this extra negative charge. So how I'm gonna handle this problem is we're gonna figure out how many electrons account for that extra negative charge then we're gonna add that number of electrons to 1.0000 to the center of 12. And that will answer the question of how many electrons does it have? Okay, so let me, uh, real estate purposes, let me do some erasing here. Keep these numbers in mind. Okay. 
Okay, so question is, first of all, how many electrons are in this um, charge? So again, nanocoulombs, negative, always want to go with the base unit. So nanocoulombs, nano is 10 to negative nine. And 5.00 times 10 to the negative nine coulomb. That's the excess charge. That's the extra electrons we must have. And again, what do we know? Um, one electron has one negative 1 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Coulombs cancel. <clears throat> that means that the number of electrons, I do this calculation, is 3.125. Again, I have a whole bunch of uh, sig, sig figs here. So it's 10 to the 10th extra electron. Okay, so that extra charge is the extra electrons, but what's the total? Well, total number of electrons of what it would have if it was neutral. Okay, so neutral would mean it would, it's got to have at least the 1.0000 times 10 to the 12th, plus this extra 3.125 times 10 to the 10th. You add these together, the number of electrons, add these two numbers together, it's going to be 1.031 times 10 to the 12 electrons. That's how many electrons we have. Pretty straightforward. All right, I'm going to do a number, another problem here. Uh, open stacks 18.7. Okay, <clears throat> that says a uh, 50.0 gram ball of copper. has a net charge of 2.00 microcoulomb. What fraction of the copper's electrons have been removed? Okay, um, there's a parenthetical statement here. Each copper atom has 29 protons. And an atomic mass of 63.5 grams. All right. So as we move along, we get more, a little bit more involved. So we have a, a macroscopic uh, mass of copper. It's 50 grams. It's a ball of copper. And it has an excess positive charge. What's that mean? Well, the copper is originally going to have. Um, um, an equal number of protons and, and electrons. However, given that the copper is positively charged, some electrons have been removed, as we as we are understanding here from just the very statement. So the fact that electrons have been removed it means negative charges have been removed, which leaves the overall ball of copper to be positive. So the question is, well, I want to figure out, first of all, 
I'm gonna figure out the fraction of electrons have been removed. So how I wanna do this problem is I wanna figure out how many electrons, first of all, how many electrons would there be in a neutral 50 gram ball of copper? You know, again, the number of protons equals number of electrons when the uh, object is neutral, which is what it normally occurs, right? Number of protons equals number of electrons. However, um, that so, so again, we want to figure out the, the equilibrium or the neutral. You know, we want to figure out how many how many electrons does this mass of copper have normally? And the question is, I want to make a fraction. I'll make a fraction of how many how many electrons are removed divided by the number of electrons that this object has normally. That's the point of this problem, all right? So I have to do a little bit of scratch work to figure all this stuff out. So again, keep all these numbers in mind. I have to erase for real estate purposes here. Okay, so um, first of all, um, I need to determine how many electrons are in the neutral copper mass. So first of all, I know for, from information, I can look at some of the periodic table or I can use the parenthetical statement, but I know that a mole of copper is or 63.5 um, U per one, I'm sorry, one atom of copper. All right, and so an atom of copper has an atomic mass of 63.5 U. Okay, and then again, if you remember, a U has an atomic mass unit. We talked about this in physics one. Well, an atomic mass unit, I mean, it's determined by the fact that there are exactly 12 protons and 12 electrons in an atom of uh, sorry, in, in, a, in an atom of, of carbon so this is based upon carbon a lot of, a lot of the uh, you know the Avogadro's number for instance is all based on carbon carbon it's why because carbon is the is the element necessary for life so again that's very important to people studying life science or organic chemistry so we use um, we use uh, carbon as a standard and so if you do this we understand that one U equals 1.66605 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms per U per an atomic mass unit. If you work this out, the one atom of copper is going to have a mass of 1.054 times 10 to the negative 25 kilograms per an atom of copper. All right, so we know how much, we know the mass of one atom of copper. However, we know we have 50 grams of copper. So there's gonna be a bunch of atoms, how many? Well, we have 50 grams of copper. Well, we always wanna go with the base unit. So that would be 50 times 10 to the negative three kilograms of copper. We know that, that's the big ball of copper that we have. It's not so big, but it's big in a compared with atomic, uh, uh, measures and again we just got done calculating right here how much one atom of copper is so we know that an atom of copper has 1.054 times 10 to the negative 25 kilograms so that means that I have a lot of atoms of copper, right? 4.744 times 10 to the 23 atoms of copper. 
I have almost a mole of copper. Okay, 4.744 times 10 to the 23 atoms of copper. That's a lot. Now, neutral copper, the, the number of, of, of protons will equal the number of electrons. Well, how many electrons or protons are in neutral copper? Well, we're told it's 29. You look at the periodic table, 29. All right, and so, so total number of electrons Again, we're talking about neutral copper it is simply going to be 29. Each atom has 29 of these electrons in its neutral form. Uh, oops, let me do this. Number of uh, atoms, okay, so we'll go 4.74 times 10 to the 23 atoms copper times 29 electrons per atom of copper. All right, we do all these calculations, we'll figure out, you know, the total number of electrons that should be in this ball of copper. You work this out, you get that that's going to be 1.376. Times 10 to the 25 electrons. Okay, so that's the total number of electrons that would be in a, um, a neutral 50 gram ball of copper. Now, now what do we do? Well, we now need to understand how many electrons were removed. All right, so let's keep this in the parking lot. Okay, that's the total. So again, I got the total number of electrons, understanding that every copper atom is gonna have 29 of these electrons. All right, so let's uh, put this in a parking lot. Uh, total number of electrons is 1.376 times 10 to the 25 electron. Great. Now, we know that the that this ball of copper actually is charged as a net positive charge, which means electrons have been removed. Well, in that case, um, in this in this particular case, uh, number of electrons removed. Well, that's going to equal what? That's going to equal the charge, which will be a negative two point zero zero times ten to the negative nine coulombs. And we're told as a positive charge of 2.0 nanocoulombs, which means that that equivalent amount in uh, negative charge was removed in terms of in, in terms of electrons. So we have uh, sorry 2. Point, negative 2.00 times 10 to the negative uh, nine coulombs, and we recall that an electron has a charge of negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So the number of electrons removed, if you do this calculation, you'll find that that is gonna be 1.25 times 10 to the 13th electrons. Now that may seem like a lot of electrons, but it pales in comparison with how many total electrons there would be in a neutral copper, uh, mass of copper. So you wanna find this fraction, fraction, of copper removed, which we're looking for, is going to be the number of electrons removed divided by the total number of electrons. All right, that will be 1.25 times 10 to the 13th electrons divided by 1.376 times 10 to the 25 electrons. And again, the, you know, fractions are in this manner are always unitless. So you're gonna get an answer of 9.08 times 10 to the negative 13. One of the things to keep in mind with electricity is that you, don't know, you do not need much of a charge and balance to have a uh, to, to, to have a large effect. 
Electric force is very, very powerful, much more powerful than the gravitational force. So you see here that there's definitely a, you know, a, a, a measurable charge, but the fraction of the electrons in order to obtain such a charge is minuscule. Miss fraction, 9.0 against 10 negative 13 is tiny. All right, and so that's the interesting thing about uh, electricity. It doesn't take much of an imbalance to, to cause uh, a large effect. Okay, so now I want to change topics. Now, one of the things that we talked about early on is that when you rub a glass rod with a, with a silk cloth, that, you, that the, the, there's a repulsive or attractive forces that are experienced. So let's start talking about forces, electric forces. All right, so we'll start in the most simple sense. We'll talk about point charges. So a French physicist Named, now again, you, I try to pronounce the French word where it is, but his name, his name is Charles Coulomb. In English would say Charles. Charles Coulomb performed a very careful set of experiments. What point charges? And determines the force law between them. Called, now called Coulomb's law. And we honor Coulomb by, uh, by uh, having the unit of charging after. Okay, so what is it? So if you have two charges, two point charges, say Q1, and we, again, we always use letter Q for charges for whatever reason. And let's say Q2, you have two point charges and they are a distance R, uh, a center to center distance R apart. The best I can put my drawing here. All right, so this is a distance R. Two charges. Coulomb found that the force of interaction between the two charges is given as K times Q1, Q2 divided by r squared and i'll say r hat which determines as the direction again the unit vector i'll talk about unit vector notation in a moment that gives a that states that it's a direction along the line connecting the center to center uh, so again this is the way uh charges um interact with each other uh, the force of interaction between two charges now, this looks very familiar with the force law that you already know from physics one. Okay, again, this is an experimentally determined force law. Force is a vector. Uh, K, by, uh, by the way, is a constant given by 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newtons meter squared per Coulomb squared. So again, this is an inverse square force law. We've seen a force law like this back in physics one. All right, so let's let's kind of do a comparison. So what do we know? We have two charges, Q1 and Q2. They are a center to center distance R apart. 
And we know that the force, you gotta put the little vector hat for the force, is K product of the charges over R squared R hat. Now, when I put a hat on a variable, R hat is what's called a unit vector. Its only job, it is of size one, so it does not affect the magnitude. It is of size one, and its only job is to point along a coordinate direction. And I'll say more about this, but again, the this is this would be referred to. I mean, R R hat. I would pronounce it R hat. I mean, that's how I pronounce it. So people who've had physics one with me are familiar with this unit vector notation. I'll say more about it as we work out some problems. All it really means here is that the force is along the line connecting the centers. This is, even though my picture doesn't really show it very well, this is a center to center force. All right, now, turns out, you know, again, this is Coulomb's law. It should remind you of another law that we talked about in physics one. And that's Newton's law of universal gravitation. Has a, diff has a very similar look. In this case, you have two masses, M1 and M2. Like maybe planets or moons or something. And there's a center to center distance between them. We'll call it R. The gravitational force. And I'll say this is an electrical force, little E for electrical. The gravitational force will be capital G M1 M2 divided by R squared, also along the line between the center, along the line connecting the centers. That's what that R hat means. It's just a unit vector. <clears throat> All right. What you see here is why you have a force. It's a constant times the product of of uh, characteristics of the of the object. You have. I mean, if an object is to pl is to play an electromagnet an electromagnetism, it must have a charge. So again, this is a fundamental property of the particles that have in order to play in a, in electromagnetic theory, they have to be charged. So the product of charges, the product of something that's a characteristic of the of the uh, objects in, in the interaction, divided by the center center distance squared. Gravitational force, well, it's also equal to a constant times the product of um, of characteristics associated with um, the objects. In this case, the mass. In order to play with gravity, you have to have a mass divided by the center center distance squared. Very similar looking laws. Now, in this case, the constant K, again, as I said, it was 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared in gravitation. G was a universal constant. It's given as 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Gravity is always attractive, though. Masses always attract one another. Whereas Coulomb's law can be attractive if like charges oh, I'm sorry, attractive if charges are unlike.
and repulsive if charges are like. So if the charges, I say like, I mean they're they're both negative or they're both positive. In that case, the force will be repulsive. If on the other hand, they're opposite charges, positive and negative, they will be attractive. So Coulomb's law, you can have an attractive or repulsive force, whereas Newton's law of gravitation, the, the force between uh, massive objects are always attractive. It's always an attractive force. All right, so given that this is, uh, now again, this plays into, now so this is the fundamental force law of the universe. This is um, an expression of the fundamental force law of the universe, electromagnetic force law, for point charges. Now we'll show a little bit later when we talk about Gauss's law that there is a more fundamental law of the universe. And we'll also talk, and we'll also talk about the electric, the, uh, what's called electric field. We generally want to express the electromagnetic force law in a general sense for an electric field, all right? And so again, this would be an expression uh, of, the electro, of, the, of the electrostatic force law for a point charge, just for a point charge. But as we do see, it's, it's a force that's caused by a characteristic or a property of the body, in this case, charge. Just like the fundamental force law of the, of of the gravitational force, um, is due because the objects have a certain characteristic called mass. Charge of objects have mass, they experience a gravitational force. If objects have charge, they experience an electromagnetic force. All right. So again, that's whole part of the fundamental forces. They they're forces because the objects possess a certain characteristic or quality or property. All right. So there's not much more to say other than you know we write down Coulomb's law and we can work some problems. There's no deriving Coulomb's law. Coulomb was able to show it in the laboratory and that we can't say why it's true. It is just true. And it's fundamental. So let's look at open sacks 18.10. Uh, what is the repulsive force? Uh, between two pith balls. That are 8.00 centimeters apart. And have equal charges. Of uh, eight negative thirty point zero nanocoulomb. All right, so I'm gonna talk about this is the first like real involved problem of the semester. And what I want to talk about again is I want I want to mention it's called showing your work. Uh, in this class, anything you turn into me you must show your work. And so I'm gonna discuss that while I work this problem. Again, you are required, and anybody who's had me before knows exactly what I'm talking about. But for those of you who haven't had me, this is, this is for you. So showing your work, what do we first do? We state the givens. And maybe I'll draw a picture. Drawing a picture is always good. So, I have two bodies, uh, Q1, Q2. There's a center to center distance of R between them. Now it turns out that Q1 equals Q2 equals negative 30.0 times 10 to the ninth, negative nine coulombs. So again, first thing I'm gonna do is state my givens. What else do I do? 
Well, I know the center to center distance. I, and I don't want to write in terms of centimeters because that doesn't do me any good. I want to write in terms of the base unit, which is meters. So 8.00 times 10 to the negative two meters. Okay. That expresses the base unit. So the next thing I want to do is I want to state the principle that I'm going to use. In this case, Coulomb's law. So again, the force is K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. And then I want to perform whatever algebra is needed, and then I will put the um, put the values in for the unknown variable or for the known variables, and then put a box around my answer. Now it turns out there's no algebra to do in this particular case. I mean the problem. Um, Essentially, I'm, I'm using Coulomb's law out of the box to answer the problem. So I, and there's no algebra to do. So I can actually immediately go to the answer. And so I have K is 8.99 times 10 to the 9th Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared is my constant K. Q1 and Q2 are the same. So I'll just put it as a square. So it's negative 30.0 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs squared. And I'll divide by r squared, which is 8.00 times 10 to the negative 2 meters. Don't forget to square that. You work that all out, you will find out that the force, the repulsive force between these pitfalls, is 1.26. Times 10 to the negative 3 newtons. Put a box around your final answer. Okay. Again, that's called showing your work. I say to my given, so I'll, I'll write this out in a moment here what show your work means. But again, there is a systematic process that I use in order to solve this problem. I don't want you just, you know, working something on scratch and giving me an answer. I, I want to see all of your work. The process of doing the problem is more important than the answer to me. More important today, you understand how to apply the concepts. That's what this class is all about. All right. So that's 18.10. Let me uh, just kind of briefly uh, discuss the whole concept of showing your work real quick. Just a quick little aside. Again, you know, you're getting these little asides in the first lecture because you know, we're just getting started. So again, what does show your work mean? What did I just do? Well, the first thing I do is I state my givens. State the givens. What are you being told in this problem? Maybe draw a picture. Pictures always help. All right. I mean, if you don't understand something, draw a picture. Drawing a picture is always, always very helpful. All right. What's the next thing you do? You write down the principle or principles that you will use. In this, in the case of the last problem, I it was Coulomb's law. All right, next, what do you do now? Well, you algebraically, or you perform algebra with the variables. Don't just start plugging in numbers way at the top. That doesn't do any, that doesn't do you or me any good, right? So perform algebra. And you're doing a physics problem. with the variables. And solve for the unknown. Variable. Now, fortunately for us, on that last problem, um, we could use Coulomb's law out of the box. There's actually no algebra to actually do. But that's oftentimes not the case. 
Oftentimes there's a lot of algebra. Then once you have the, uh, once you've solved for the unknown variable, now we substitute the known variables with values. We know these values, so now it's time to plug the values in. Finally, you draw a box or express the final answer and draw a box around it. That is officially showing your work. Okay. So I did all that, except I didn't have to do much or any algebra. So again, state the givens. Maybe draw a picture. I did both of them. I did both of those things. Write down the principle that you, you will use. In the last problem, I, I wrote down Coulomb's law. That's the way I'm going to, that's the law that I need to use, the principle I need to use to solve the problem. Now, perform the algebra with the variables. Don't just start plugging in numbers. You actually perform the algebra. I want to see the actual physics being in, in play. Solve for the unknown variable, and then finally substitute the known variables with the values. Now, do you have one, the unknown variable on the left side and everything else on the right side? Finally, you'll express the final answer and draw a box around it. That's called showing your work. That's what you need to do to get credit for anything in this class. That would include homework problems, exam problems, and um, sometimes lab problems as well. Sometimes there's problems to do in the lab. All right, so again, that is that is showing your work. All right, I wanna do another uh, problem. Do Opus X 18.11. All right. Um, A. How strong is the attractive force? between a glass rod glass rod with a 0 0.700 microcoulomb charge and a silk cloth. With a negative 0 0.600 microcoulomb charge. <laughs> Which are 12.0 centimeters apart. Using the approximation, they act like point charges. And then B. Uh, B says, discuss how the answer to this problem is 
might be effective. If the charges are distributed over some area, Yeah. Um, and do not act like point charges. Let's see. All right, so the problem reads 18.11, open stacks. How strong is the attractive force between a glass rod with a 0.700 microcoulomb charge and a silk cloth with a negative 0.600 microcoulomb charge, which are 12.0 centimeters apart, using the approximation that they act like point charges? And B, discuss how the answer to this problem might be affected if the charges are distributed over some area and do not act like point charges. All right, so first we're going to make an approximation that the charges are concentrated at the center of mass. They act like point charges. Clearly a glass rod and a silk cloth are not point charges, but we're going to make the assumption that they are and see what our calculation is. Then we're gonna discuss um, how the answer would change if they, if they really are not point charges, which is the case. All right, so I'm gonna erase the, the board here. Keep in mind these numbers. Okay, so um, for real estate purposes, so first of all, part A, I'm gonna state the givens. And so we're gonna say the Q1's, the glass rod, positive 0 0.700 microcoulombs, so micro means times 10, the negative six coulombs, that's the glass, Rod, uh, Q2, say my givens, that's the silk cloth, negative 0 0.600 times 10 to the negative six coulomb, silk cloth. The distance between them, assuming these are point charges, R is 12 centimeters, but I want to use uh, base units of 0 0.120 meters. That's the center to center distance. Again, we're assuming glass rod and silk cloth act like point charges. So that we can use Coulomb's law. Remember, Coulomb's law only applies to problems that are point charges. Only applies to point charges. So Coulomb's law is very specific. You must be talking about point charge problems in order to use it. All right. So again, one minute, I'm going to state my uh, my uh, my principle, which is Coulomb's law. And, and again, I'll, I'll be fortunate. I don't actually have to do any algebra. So uh, F, I care really about, at this point, I just care about the magnitude, so I'm going to write it this way. F is K times the absolute value of Q1 times Q2 divided by R squared. And again, I don't have any algebra to do, so I can just put numbers in immediately. So that's going to be 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Okay, 
times the absolute value, if I can fit all this stuff in, uh, 0 0.700 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs, uh, negative 0 0.600, 10 to the negative 6 coulombs, and then absolute value on that divided by 0 0.120 meters squared. Working all this out, I get that the force is going to be 0 0.262 newton. Put a box around my answer. Again, I put the absolute values because I just I just want a magnitude at this point. Now part B says, well, what if what if that you know that we have to that we cannot utilize or, or use this concept of the point charge? How does that actually change my answer? What does that do to my answer? All right, and so let's look at B. All right, wait, open stacks, 18.11 B. Well, if that's the case, what's, what's really going to happen here is that we want, we're making the assumption that the, um, the glass rod and the silk cloth would be, uh, all the charge would be concentrated at their center of mass. But if the if in case well we really are, know that the charges actually distribute, and so what's really going to happen is the glass rod. Let's say you have the glass rod. Well, we're making the assumption here that the glass rod, and say the silk cloth, the charges are at the center of mass. So we'll say Q1, Q2. And the center and center distance is R. Well, in reality, though, what's really going to happen is you'll see the charges actually distributing to be as close to the silk cloth as possible. And likewise, the negative charge in the silk cloth will actually be getting closer. So effectively, you would actually have a smaller value R prime. And so if we look at the uh, Coulomb's law, well, we know that the force is K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. Well, if you have an effectively smaller R, when you divide a fraction by a smaller denominator, the fraction gets bigger. So overall, given that the charges really do distribute and they're really gonna wanna get as close together as possible, because they do attract each other, what you're really going to get is an actual answer that's going to be bigger than the answer that you assume when you when you did your uh, when you did your point charge uh, approximation. You actually have an answer that should be bigger than the uh, what was it um, 0 0.262 newtons. All right. Now, how do I write this in words? I, mean, I wrote it in, in pictures for you, but how would I write this in words? I would say something like this: Assuming. I mean, I would actually include in my answer, I would include both a nice picture and some little word description. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit verbose. So assuming the center of mass is separated by 12.0 centimeters. We'll say assume, assuming that the centers, two objects involved here, of mass are separated by 12.0 centimeters. Um, the answer in part A um, assumes that the charges are concentrated at the center at the center of mass. Right. 
But if, however, the uh, chargers are distributed over some area, then uh, there will be a concentration of charge along the side closest to the obsolete, obsolete charged object, just like I drew. So there will be a concentration of charge uh, along the side closest to the charged object. Uh, oh, to the oppositely charged object, be, be uh, more precise. Okay, um, the effect will increase the net force, as I said in the picture. So I think you write out verbiage like this and combine that with the picture, you set everything. So as I said, assuming the centers of mass are separated by 12.0 centimeters, the answer part is assumes that the charges are concentrated at the centers of mass. If, however, the charges are distributed over some area, there will be a concentration of charge along the side closest to the oppositely charged object. The effect will increase the net force. I would say something like that. Again, you're making the assumption of a, of a point charge, but in reality, you really can't say that. You can, you have, you have to have, you're going to use, you have to make that assumption if you intend to use Coulomb's law. Okay, but because Coulomb's law only applies to point charges. All right, next problem. I'm going to do open stacks 18.12. All right, that says uh, two point charges exert a 5.00 Newton force on each other. What will the force become? What will the force become? Uh, if the distance between them is increased by a factor of three. All right, two point charges exert a 5.00 Newton force on each other. What will be the force between them? Oh, what, sorry, what will the force become if the distance between them is increased by a factor of three? All right, so again, um, you know, I think uh, you ought to try to draw a couple of pictures here to figure out what it is we're talking about. 
So in the original configuration, we know that, you know, there's a five Newton force between them. I'm gonna erase this for the purpose of the real estate here. So the initial problem, initially, What do we have? Well, we have Q1, Q2, and some center to center distance R, two point charge center to center distance R. All right. And then new configuration, we have Q1 spread out, the same Q. And further out, we have the point charge Q2. I'm gonna see if I can try to draw a line here. Center to center now is gonna be three R. Now we'll just say here that there's a force F equals 5.0 Newtons in this arrangement. Let's say that the arrangement down here, we have a force F prime. And we wanna figure out what F prime is. So applying Coulomb's law in the original configuration, we know that, well, F is K. And again, I don't care um, right now about signs. I'm just really looking at magnitude. So I will put the absolute value of Q1 times Q2 divided by R squared. And that would give us 5.0 Newtons. I mean, we know what F is. What about F prime? What about the new configuration? Well, F prime would be what? K times the absolute value of the same charges, Q1 times Q2, now divided by three R quantity squared. Well, the square of a product is a product of the squares, right? And so I could write three R as three squared R squared or nine R squared. So K, absolute value Q1, Q2 over nine R squared. Square of a product is a product of the squares. This is three squared times R squared, all right? And I could be even more clever by putting a one, by putting a nine out front. So I can actually write this as one ninth K times absolute value Q1, Q2 over R squared. Now, if I look at K, that's about Q1, Q2 over R squared. Well, hey, I know what that is. That's F, isn't it? So that means that this is one ninth F. Or F prime is one ninth times five Newtons. Or F prime, five divided by nine is 0 0.556 Newtons. So if I take these same two charges, and if, I mean, if they're in the original configuration, you know, that you see above, and that's, uh, that gives you five Newtons. If I take their distance and I triple it, I have taken the uh, force down to from five newtons to 0.556 newtons. So it's a big effect on the force. All right. Again, the way to do physics problems is to do a lot. I mean, sorry, the way to learn physics is to do a lot of problems. So let me uh, do another problem. 18.16 for open set. All right, so that says what? A test charge of positive microcoulombs is placed halfway between, is placed halfway. between a 
charge of positive six microcoulombs. And another positive four microcoulomb. Separated by 10 centimeters. Okay. Um, A. What is the magnitude of the force on the test charge? And uh, B, what is the direction of the force, away or toward the positive six microcoulomb charge? Okay, so again, definitely wanna draw a picture here. So a test charge, test charge is always positive, by the way, I'll say more about that in a moment, but a test charge of positive two microcoulombs is placed halfway between a charge of positive six microcoulombs and another positive four microcoulombs, separated by a 10 centimeters. A, what is the magnitude of the force on the test charge? And B, what is the direction of the force away or toward the positive six microcoulomb charge? Okay, so again, you're gonna to wanna to draw a picture on this and you're gonna to wanna to establish an orientation to, uh, to determine, um, you know, direction, essentially. You know, direction is very important here. It's a one-dimensional problem, so it's not so bad, but again, you gotta know if you're going left or right. All right, and so let's, uh, we gotta draw a picture. Picture is absolutely necessary with problems like this. And I'm erasing for real estate purposes. All right, so what do we what do we know? Well, we're gonna have a situation here. So we have a test charge. No, I'm sorry, not a test charge, a charge, another charge, and a test charge in between. All right, and so we know that. We'll call it Q1 is positive six microcoulombs. Well, let's just do this. I have Q1 on the left. I have Q sub T, T stands for test. And I have Q2 in the right. Um, and then each of these, this whole distance is 10 centimeters. So this is gonna be five centimeters. And this is going to be five centimeters because they're halfway between. If you read the problem. Q1, that's my positive six microcoulomb uh, charge. Q2, uh, Q2 is positive four microcoulomb. Micro means 10 to the negative six. Q test is positive two microcoulombs. All right, so that's what I have going on. Now, forces, as you should recall, are, um, they, uh, they add by, um, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, well, they add, uh, they, are, they are additive. And so, um, so the uh, idea here is that you you um, you add you add the forces um, 
each one of, I mean, each one of them, they, they, they all add up. All right. And so what I'm going to, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, well, let's kind of write things down a little bit. I, I don't, when I do, when I do these, um, these four, when I do calculations like this, I, I, I know what I'm looking for, superposition. Sorry about that. Forgot that word for a moment here. So they add by superposition. So when you add these forces up, literally you're going to add the force between Q1 and Q test and Q2 and Q test. And they just add. All the forces from various sources are going to add to Q test. All right. And so what you really want to write down is the force on the test charge is going to equal the, again, superposition, the force of charge one on the test charge plus the force of charge two on the test charge. So it's a vector quantity. Now, when I, when I add electrical forces, I do not want to concern myself with the signs of the charges. I want to just consider, I'm going to just multiply charges together without worrying about the sign. What I want to do is establish an orientation and realize what the interaction is between each, each uh, pair of charges and what direction the uh, test charge will be pushed in accordance with that interaction. So first of all, we establish an orientation. So I'm going to say, because you know, all these electromagnetic problems, electromagnetic theory problems are, well, most of them are vector problems. I'm going to say that to the left is negative and to the right is positive. This is my, this is my axis, my orientation for the problem. And I want to adhere to that orientation throughout the entire problem. All right, so I don't care right now about signs. And again, they're all positive anyway. What I care about is what each, um, what, what the, what each charge is going to do to the test charge. All right, so, and that'll apply a sign. You're just going to get pushed to the right or pushed to the left. If it's pushed to the right, the term becomes positive. If it's pushed to the left, it becomes negative. So the force on the test charge. is going to be well it's each it's going to be um consecutive uh interactions of coulomb's law so let's see force on one the test charge so it's, what's that going to be well it's going to be k times the absolute value of q1 times q test divided by r1 t no basically this would be r1 and test squared now the question is well what direction is the interaction of q1 going to do to the test charge well q1 is positive q test test charge is always positive so a pop so two positive charges are going to repel one another that means that q1 is going to have the effect of repelling the test charge i.e pushing it to the right so because of that, I will say that that's positive because the interaction of Q test with respect to Q1 is going to be the push Q, Q test to the right because two positive charges are repulsive. They, they experience a repulsive force. Now, Q now the next term is gonna be Q test with Q2. Again, both those charges are, are um, positive, so there's going to be repulsion. Now, Q test repels from Q2. That's going to have the effect of pushing it to the left or negative. So a negative K, that's a value of Q1, or sorry, Q2, Q test, over R2T square so again i assign the signs sign signs in accordance with what the interaction what where is a test charge going to get pushed or pulled if, if one of these charges was negative and i assign and i assign the signs according to that 
So again, Q1 is positive, Q test is positive. They're gonna repel each other, which is gonna cause Q, T, Q, T, Q test to be, or Q sub T to be pushed to the right. Hence positive, because right means positive, in my orientation. And on the other hand, the interaction of Q test with Q2, again, that's gonna be a repulsive interaction. That's going to have the effect of pushing Q test to the left. And I have deemed my orientation that left is negative, hence negative. Okay, so now what's left to do is to, and I also want to point out that R1T happens to equal R2T here, which is 0 0.05 meters, five centimeters. All right, and so I can say that I can just call this, in this case, R. And so in that particular case, I can call this R and I can pull out some constant variables. So F sub T will be K over R squared times brackets. And then again, that Q1 and QT are positive anyway, so I'm not gonna worry so much about the sign. So I have Q1 QT plus, or sorry, minus, Q2, QT, and that's what I have. All right, so with that said, um, all right, with that said, I, I need to uh, now put, put numbers in. All right, so F test is going to be 8 point, let me give myself some more room here. K is 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared divided by 0 0.05 meters quantity square and then times brackets we're going to have uh this i can actually pull q yeah, no no well i can actually pull q test out of this as well so i can actually it comes out as a square so give me a little algebra here. I have k q test squared over r squared and then when i'm left with this point it's just q1 minus q2 20 squared i can factor out q test just simplifying things all right so in that particular sense what i can what i can now do is uh is right down um, that this is going to be uh, Q test quantity squared. That's going to be uh, uh, 2.0 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. That's squared. And then you have, uh, let's see here. Uh, Six times ten negative six coulombs minus four times ten to the negative six coulombs quantity squared. You work all that out, you find out that force on test is going to be. You work this out, you find out that it's going to be positive fourteen point four newtons, or IE, or otherwise we can call that. 14.4 newtons to the right. Remember, it's a vector problem, so it has a magnitude and a direction. The plus sign in my orientation means to the right. And so, again, I can either write this as positive 14.4 newtons, the positive means to the right, or I can write it as a magnitude 14.4 newtons to the right. Magnitude and direction, either way. This is my final answer.
All right, um, let's look at 18.17. All right, um, that one says uh, bear free charges. Do not remain stationary when close together. To illustrate this, um, calculate the acceleration of two isolated protons. Oops. Calculate the acceleration. of two isolated protons separated by 2.00 nanometers. Typical distance between gas atoms. All right, so we're going to use some physics one uh, concepts. All right, so it says bare free charges. It means they're free to move around. They're in proximity to each other. Do not remain stationary when close together. Why? Because they feel a force. They have a mass. They feel a force, then they're going to accelerate, right? That's Newton's second law. So to illustrate this, calculate the acceleration of two isolated protons separated by 2.00 nanometers, a typical distance between gas atoms. All right, so we're going to, we're going to now work out the uh, acceleration here. So, um, so let's draw a little picture. So again, I need real estate uh, as much as possible, so I'm going to erase what I have here. All right, so what do we know? We have a couple of protons. All right, and so we know they're gonna each have a positive Q sub E, that's their charge. They're going to feel repulsion because they're both positively charged. Uh, there's gonna a distance R between them. R, we were told, is 2.00 nanometer. 2.00 times 10 to the negative 9 meters. All right, so, so Coulomb's law gives the repulsive force. between the protons. So each proton is gonna feel the same force. So that force is given as K Q sub E squared divided by R squared. Now each proton is gonna feel the same force. If an object has a mass and feels a force, what do we know about Newton's second law? Well, that's going to equal the mass times acceleration. And this is from Newton's second law. So we're going back to physics one. And physics is by definition comprehensive. So again, we're always going to be borrowing from physics one. 
Okay, so again, given that a particular mass feels a force, it doesn't really matter what the why the force turns out the force is because of the Coulomb force, but given it has a mass, it's going to accelerate. An object that experiences a force accelerates. All right, and so we can we can now um, we can now uh, um, solve for the acceleration. So a is going to be k. Again, doing some algebra, q to b squared divided by m r squared. All I just did is this cross multiply, put M in the denominator, and I flip about the equal sign, solve for the acceleration. I'm now ready to apply uh, some numbers. So A will be 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. The, fun the charge at a proton is a fundamental charge. 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs quantity squared. And you can look up the mass of a proton in your book. I look it up, it's 1.673 times 10 to the 27 kilograms. And uh, this distance, R squared, 2.00 times 10 to the negative nine meters squared. Plug in numbers, so I, what have I done? I stated the given, drew a picture, um, stated the, uh, the concept, so did the algebra, solved the, you know, all, everything on the right-hand side I know. Again, I'm doing it all with the variables and the unknown is what's on the left-hand side, the acceleration. Now I'm ready to plug in the values and now, um, all I have to do now is, uh, and again, I, I, I'm out of space. Well, maybe I have enough space. The acceleration is equal to 3.44 times 10 to the 16th meters per second squared. Let me just write this a little higher. Again, that'd be the normal thing, but I, I have real estate challenges here, so. I'm going to erase this. And when I do this calculation, I get A equals 3.44. We're going to find out the acceleration is tremendous times 10 to the 16 meters per second squared. That is many, 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 many Gs. So two protons are going to accelerate away from each other very, um, with a very large acceleration. All right, that is Coulomb's force law. But as I said before, you know, um, electromagnetic theory is a field concept. And so um, and we didn't really talk much about this concept in physics one. But if you kind of go back to physics one for a moment, you know, let's say, for instance, that I go back to physics one. Now let's say I have, oh, let's see here. Um, I have the earth. Has a radius R sub E. Radius of the earth, right? Now, if I have some sort of an object, you know, let's say some sort of a mass, and we know the earth has a big mass, we'll say capital M. But you know what, if I have, so essentially I can think of, if I happen to have a certain mass little m, then I know that there's gonna be a center to center uh, force between them. And, and again, the, because of symmetry, the earth is gonna act as a point mass located at the center of mass. I mean, we've said, we talked about that in, in physics one, the center of mass concept. So I know that, the force, the gravitational force, would be given as G M M over R sub E squared. Why do I feel that force? I feel that force because, I mean, if, if, that's, if that's my mass, let's say I'm standing on top of the earth and I feel that force. I feel that force because I have a certain mass. Another mass would, would go in that place and feel a different force. 
So there's an interaction, there's a gravitational field that's emanating from the Earth at all times. So we can actually think of this as a field concept. We can think of there being a gravitational field emanating from the Earth, probably an attractive field. Radially inward, it's always going to be, you know, inward. And it's always drawing me toward the center of the Earth. This would be a gravitational field. That is always felt. That is always there. Because the Earth has a mass, there's a gravitational field. I feel a force, or any other mass feels a force, when it is put someplace in this field. Right, once you put a mass in that field, now that mass feels a force. All right, and so again, you can think of the gravitation in a similar way. We didn't, we never thought of it that way in physics one, but you could. All right, and so in a similar way, you know, and again, another thing to think about is. Isn't it a difficult concept to think about when, let's say, here on Earth, we are 93 million miles away from the sun. And yet the sun has such a strong gravitational effect on us. I mean, we are, we are pulled around in a, in, a, in a circular orbit all the time. But don't you wonder, why, why would the sun, which is so far away, have such an effect on us? Well, the, the reality is the sun is a very, very large mass and it has a, a, a gravitational field that it emanates everywhere. The earth feels a gravitational force because it is a mass placed somewhere in that gravitational field. So we're seeing action at a distance. We're seeing that we're being, we're being affected by a force millions of miles away. And yet, you know, and that's because the, the sun has this gravitational field. If, we, if the Earth was closer, it'd be a, it'd be a larger uh, field, all right? And so, so this concept of action at a distance or a force at a distance is made more palatable by a field concept. And so in the same, in the same way, um, you know, we know that the, um, and then another, another, another problem we have as well, is let's imagine here that I have a charge, a point charge, capital Q. This is the charge I care about. And yet, I know there's a field someplace, but the, the question is, well, if I happen to put a test charge Q test at say a distance R, from this charge, I'm, in, I'm interested in, in capital Q. But I have to, to know something about capital Q, I gotta put a test charge in, its, in, in an area around it. And, and then what do I know? Well, I know then that the Coulomb force is gonna tell me that the force is gonna be K, little Q, or let's say Q test, times the charge that I'm interested in, divided by R squared. But the, here's the problem. I am giving information based upon the test charge. You know, when I take your, if you take your temperature, you know, for instance, you say, oh, I'm 98.6 degrees. I don't have to say, oh, I'm 98.6 degrees based upon the thermometer I bought at Walmart or based upon the thermometer I bought at Walgreens. I don't have to actually put the method in which I did my measurement in the calculation. The problem I have here is that, well, Q sub I really am interested in, in capital Q. That's the charge I'm interested in. But my answer involves the way I did the measurement. You don't want that. You don't want, you want to actually know about capital Q. You don't want, you don't want to have to involve the way you did the measurement. I mean, that, that should not be part of it. So we, we develop a concept called electric field. All right, so electric field, um, by its very definition, is defined 
So we define what's called electric field. And it's defined as the electric force, I just got done calculating, divided by the test charge. I don't want to describe my measurements by a test charge. So I'm gonna divide it out. So I'm gonna take the electric field and I'm gonna divide it by, I'm gonna take the electric force divided by the test charge. This defines what's called the electric field. So given that a test charge is always positive, we always have positive test charges, the electric field and the electric force. on a positive test charge have the same direction. I mean, again, you're just taking a vector dividing by a positive constant or a positive uh, real number, and you're gonna get another vector and it's gonna be in the same direction. When you, multiply or, when you multiply or divide by a vector by some positive number, all you're doing is you're, you're um, enhancing or you're elongating or shrinking that vector, but the direction stays the same, okay? And so, well, we do this concept with the charge distribution. Well, we, we, we actually can get an electric field. Now, again, we're going to find out. You know, we're going to find out in general. We have a more complicated Maxwell equation that we need to get to get electric field based upon what's called a charge distribution. But and sometimes that's very difficult to do. But we do have a very easy way for the point for the particular case of a test charge of interest. We can express an electric field directly and exactly. And so again, let's see how we can do that. So again, we're looking at electric field. Let's kind of, I've already kind of did some of the derivation already. So again, we know Coulomb's law. The force between the test charge and the charge of interest, capital Q, is going to be K Q test times capital Q divided by R squared. And what did I just say? Well, I said that we have a we have a situation where the um, the electric field is the is the electric force dividing out the test charge. Now, if I do that, then I if I divide both if I divide this top equation both by the by Q sub t again as I as I advertise, I will cancel out Q sub t on the right hand side. So we actually know exactly what the electric field is for a test charge of interest is K capital Q over R squared, R hat. The R hat again is a unit vector that says that the, the um, direction of the electric field is radially, either outward or inward, depending upon whether the charge is positive or negative. If the charge is positive, then electric field lines will actually emanate away from the positive charge, but emanate toward a negative charge. All right, and so, so again, this is a radial, radial charge. So again, we know for a point charge, point charge only, we can write that formula. So the electric field is K cap Q, over R squared R hat for a point charge of interest of magnitude cap Q. All right, now R hat means radial, right? 
And so if the charge is positive, if cap Q is positive, the electric field line, are radially outward. So here would be my capital Q, and electric field lines are everywhere radial. Okay, that's my electric field. Why? Because the force is also radial, right? And so all I'm doing is dividing by a positive test charge. And so we know that the electric field for, uh, if, if capital Q is positive, it's going to push away a positive test charge. So that means that the electric field would be radially outward. On the other hand, if Q is negative, so if cap Q is negative, As you can imagine, the electric field is radially inward. So again, if my cap Q is negative, then the electric field would be radially inward. It would have the effect of pulling in a positive test charge. Okay. Electric field is radially outward for a point charge. Again, these are point charges. Point charge capital Q. That's my interest is a point charge capital Q. If it's a positive point charge, the electric field lines are radially outward. If it's a negative point charge, the radial the electric field lines are radially inward. Again, I'm all, again when I'm when I'm doing electromagnetic theory, when I'm doing electricity, I am interested in a charge distribution. I'm interested in what the electric field is around a charge distribution. Most of the time, I don't know that answer. Most of the time, the charge distribution is is very complicated. I have a I have a situation where I have a charge distribution that I do know about, and I do understand. And that's the point charge. The point charge, I can write down what the electric field is about a point charge automatically. But in general, I can't do that. All right, so let's um, work a couple of problems out. Get ourselves some uh, idea here. Again, so electric field is an extremely important concept. In fact, when I talk about the electromagnetic force law, there'll be two terms. Again, I'm kind of getting a, a um, peering into the future here. There will be two terms. The first term is literally going to be QE, just like I wrote down. Then we'll have a term for magnetism. So we'll, I have, I'm not going to talk about it yet, but there is a magnetic term. If I wrote it down, it would just be confusing. But here's the electric term. Here's the magnetic term. So Bob, I've already given you in the first lecture, I've already given you the first term in the electromagnetic force law. And again, it has to be in terms of fields. Electromagnetic theory is a theory of fields. So we're going to have electric field. We're going to later on have a magnetic field. We'll, we'll drive in a couple of chapters. Okay, it's a field theory. And we're already kind of Feeling out our, our force law here. So I'm going to look at um, OpenStax 18.27. Uh, that says, what is the magnitude and direction of electric field?
that exerts a 2.00 times 10 negative 5 Newton upward force. On a negative 1.70, I'm sorry, on a negative 1.75 microcoulomb charge. And so there's a lot of accounting for sign, since I G and sign. You have to be careful. All right. So, so again, what is the magnitude and direction of an electric field? Um, that exerts a 2.00 times 10 negative 5 Newton upper, upward force on a negative 1.75 microcoulomb charge. Okay, so definitely you want to draw pictures when you do electromagnetic theory. You definitely want, I mean, because you, you, to make sense out of any problem, you have to draw some pictures. So I'm going to erase the words because of real estate here. Normally I keep all this up on the board if we're meeting face to face. But let's draw again an orientation. So again, my orientation is, we now have a two-dimensional problem. My orientation is gonna be positive Y hat up, negative Y hat down, positive X hat to the right, negative X hat to the left. Okay, now let me um, make a quick aside for those who have not had them before. Oh, again, what these hats mean. All right, so let's just make a quick aside. So if I take a vector in two dimension, let's just say, for instance, here I have the x-axis and the y-axis like you normally would think, and I have some vector A. Okay, now the vector A We'll make an angle theta, we'll say, with the x, x axis. Now, again, I have a what's called a right handed coordinate system or an orthogonal coordinate system, which means that I'm choosing a coordinate system, in this case, the Cartesian coordinate system, that meet at right angles to each other. That's what orthogonal means. It's a, it's a fancy word. So, all these are coordinate systems are orthogonal, it means it meets at right angles with each other. So what I can do is I can say, well, I have a vector A and I can express it as there's so much of it in the X direction, so much in the Y direction. I specify the direction by a unit vector. So I can say, well, let's see here, I can draw a diagonal here and I know that, you know, this um, coordinate would be say A sub X the amount of A in the X direction, and this vertical coordinate would be so much A sub Y. So I can write this vector A as so much A sub X, and then to, to, for me to know what coordinate I'm talking about, I label it as X hat. All that says is it's this much, either this way or this way. It just points, to the axis plus so much a sub y y hat. All it says is I have this much, this much of a. And what direction is it? Oh, it's, it's in the it's in the vertical y hat. And I know from trigonometry that a sub x is a cosine theta in this case. And again, look, I'll for the first time, for those who haven't had me before, I'll slow it down. I have a right triangle, right? I have an angle, I have the adjacent, I have, I have the hypotenuse. So remember, cosine of theta is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. In this case, the adjacent is A sub X, and the hypotenuse is A. I take the hat off. And I, and, I, and I basically, it's the length of the vector A. And I can write A sub X as A cosine theta. 
in the same token, I can say, oh, well, what about the y-axis? Well, I know that the sine of theta is the opposite or the hypotenuse or the a sub y over a. <clears throat> and I can say that a sub y is a sine of theta. So I, I now, now that I know the magnitude and the direction of the vector, which be given as magnitude and an angle, I can actually write down what these actually are. So in general, a vector A, and this is just an aside, would be A cosine theta times X hat plus A sine theta Y hat. Again, the unit vectors, they're size one, and their only job is to point this much in the X direction, this much in the Y direction. That's the way I write the vectors out. The unit vectors are nothing but pointers, if you will, uh, uh, in, along orthogonal coordinates. <clears throat> so when you see this, I put the hats down to basically tell you what the coordinate axes are. So we have a two-dimensional problem. Again, this is the end of the aside. We have a two-dimensional problem. And, 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 and again, if, you, if you're not sure about vectors, I would, I would actually, I have all my videos on YouTube. Um, I would look at the one that deals with vectors. That'd be the chapter one video. So again, the chapter one, I mean, I'll just, if you need me to help you uh, find it, my chapter one video uh, talks about vectors. I mean, the nice thing about my class is that you can actually go back and review chapter one material that you may not understand. So the chapter one video on YouTube, so again, it's a, on YouTube. So if you go to Marco Callahan chapter one, you'd get that chapter one video on YouTube and it'll tell you all about vectors. And it'll give you a, a, a good description of everything I'm talking about here. <clears throat> so again, that's the nice thing is that all my chapter one video, oh, all my chapter, all my um, physics one videos, all, all chapters one through 17 are on YouTube. So you can always do a review. And you know, you as a physics two student who may have never had me before, can, can have me if you, before, if you will, if you watched that particular video, just as if all the students who did have me before. All right, so let's look at my orientation. Now, what am I being told? I'm being told that we have an upward force. F is gonna be positive. 2.00 times 10 to the negative 5 newtons y hat. That means positive which direction along the y coordinate. That's all that tells you. I also know the charge, Q. Q is negative, negative 1.75 times, and again, microcoulombs, 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. Okay, so now. I know that F equals QE or EQ. All right, so if I know force and I know a charge, I know there's a relationship with the electric field. The charge times electric field gives you the force. Well, it turns out that the thing I don't know is electric fields. Again, these are my givens. This is the equation I'm gonna use. And I, the algebra I have to do is real simple. I just have to divide both sides, flip about the equal sign, divide both sides by Q. So it's going to be nothing more than F over Q. Or <clears throat> you got to be careful of the signs. Positive 2.00 times 10 to the negative 5 newtons. Y hat divided by negative. 1.75 times 10 to the negative six coulomb. Now, <clears throat> something interesting is yes, the force might be up, but because it's a negative charge, the electric field is actually going to be down. I'll find out that the electric field will actually be negative. So I'd be very careful of my signs. It'll be negative 11.4 and electric field units as you can imagine, are newtons per coulomb. 
And there's no special physicist that you honor with that. You just say Newtons per Coulomb. That would be the units for electric field. So Newtons per Coulomb. And what's the negative, what's that mean? Or that's Y hat. So again, <clears throat> that says negative 11.4 Newtons per Coulomb Y hat, or I could write this in the equivalent way of saying 11.4 Newtons per Coulomb down. Either way works fine. That the unit vector notation just allows me to understand directions very concisely. All right, let's uh, work another problem on the open stacks. I want to work open stacks 18.32. All right, this problem says A, find the direction of magnetic electric field Um, that exerts a 4.80 times 10 to the negative 17 Newton westward force. on an electron. And then B, what magnetic direction force Uh, does this field exert on a proton? All right, so find the direction and magnitude of an electric field that exerts a 4.80 times 10 negative 17 newton westward force on an electron and b what magnitude and direction force does this field exert on a proton all right so again you want to look at um be very careful and cognizant of of uh directions so you want to draw a picture particularly your orientation all right so Initially, we know that there's a westward force on, on, a, on an electron. That's a lot of information right there. We know the direction of the force. Of course, we know the electron has a negative Q sub E charge, right? So we want to find the electric field uh, in, the first, in the first one. So, and then when we find that electric field, then we'll stick a proton in there, because we now we know the electric field. We'll put a proton in there and find out um, what force that it feels. All right, so we, we don't know the electric field. All right, so the givens are that the force on the electron is negative 4.80. So again, um, strong orientation. Okay, so, um, you know, we have north, south, east and west, well, we probably better, would rather have positive x hat, positive y hat, negative x hat, negative y hat. That's what we'd prefer to have, all right? And so the force 
that the electron feels, part A, is negative uh, 4.80 times 10 to the negative 17 newtons x hat. So again, everything's vectors in electromagnetic theory. So it's, it's a vector theory. So you know, those who had me in physics one, you know, we started off with a lot of vectors and mechanics, and we had a break from vectors when we did thermal physics. Well, we're back in vectors now. All right, and so you know, definitely brush up on your on your vectors. Again, we're talking about an electron in part A, so we know it's very important to put down the appropriate sign. So negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. All right, so um, we want to find out. We we're going to use the formula. You know, the concept F is Q sub B E. We want to find the electric field. So I'll solve for the electric field by dividing by flipping about the equal sign divided by Q sub E, two steps of algebra on one. So electric field is going to be F divided by Q sub E. All right, and so that's going to be the negative 4.80 times 10 to the negative 17 newtons per coulomb. I'm uh, sorry, Newtons, Newtons, <clears throat> x hat, uh, divided by, uh, again, just be very careful with signs, negative 1.60 times 10 negative 19 coulombs, that's the charge of an electron. Negative divided by a negative is a positive. So the electric field is actually to the right. Electric field is going to be, when you work this out, it's going to be 300, so positive 300 newtons per coulomb x hat. Or you can always, you know, again, one of the ways that I always tell you is always return the problem manner that you got it. So we're, this, the problem was discussed to us in terms of the cardinal directions, north, south, east, west. So you should return the problem that way. So positive 300 newtons per coulomb x hat also means. 300 newtons per coulomb east. All right, so that's another way of writing this force out. Oh, sorry, not force, uh, electric field. So again, either positive 300 newtons per coulomb that way, positive x hat, or 300 newtons per coulomb east. Okay, that's the electric field in this arrangement. We understood the force on the electron. We understood that it is an electron. So whatever the arrangement happens to be, maybe it's a parallel plate arrangement we'll talk about later, but the electric field is a constant 300 newtons per meter, I'm sorry, 300 newtons per, per, per coulomb x hat. <clears throat> now what we're gonna do is say, okay, well, now we know the electric field, let's put a proton in there and figure out what the force is. Okay, so that's the electric field now. So now we know the electric field, we got the electric field, now let's put a proton in and see what happens. Okay, so part B says, okay, we understand the electric field in our arrangement. Let's now, instead of sticking up an electron in there, let's make it a proton. That's part B. So part B, we want to find the we want to find the force now. We don't know the force on the proton. So we have a proton now. But we do know the electric field because we just computed it. In our arrangement, the electric field is 300 newtons per coulomb x hat. We do know that. We also know the charge. The charge is going to be positive Q sub E or the charge Q will be positive Q sub E or positive 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. We want to find the force on the proton. Again, this is for the proton. That's what we're sticking in there now. So force is simply going to be QE or positive Q sub E times E, electric field, or positive 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs times 
positive 300 newtons per coulomb x hat. <clears throat> positive times a positive, of course, is a positive. If you work this out, you'll find out on the proton that the force is going to simply be positive 4.80 times 10 to the negative 17 newtons uh, x hat or positive or actually or 4.80 times 10 to the negative 17 newtons east. Again, the x hat is nothing but a pointer. It's either saying, okay, it's a positive value pointing along the x direction that way, or you can have a magnitude and a direction in the cardinal direction. You can just say east. I take off the sign because the sign indicates, I mean, the east indicates a direction. Okay, so one of the things we want to do, a very important um, tool that we will use in doing electric field analysis or what are called electric field lines. Okay, so that's the next thing we're going we're to understand. We're going to do a little drawing here. We're going to draw electric field lines. So the electric field lines, you know, you don't you don't actually see them. That's a that's one of the tough things about electromagnetic theory, is that it's an abstract theory. A lot of what we study in this class we actually cannot see, and so we have to try to find some way of visualizing the problems, visualizing these abstract invisible concepts. One of the ways of doing this is using electro electric field lines. Electric field lines provide us a map. <clears throat> so, so essentially, they're drawings um, using lines to represent electric fields. Um, around charged objects. All right, that's what they are. That's what electric field lines are, and they're useful in visualizing the, the electric field strength and direction. So that's what makes them useful is they're, they form like maps. They're, they give me the ability to actually visualize what I cannot see. You know, again, electromagnetic theory is very abstract. So since an electric field is a vector, it has a magnitude and direction. And hence, it can be represented 
by an arrow. of length and direction so that's what makes electric field lines possible is that i can actually make electric fields like arrows so again we you know we talk about vectors we, we express them in terms of arrows in space that have a certain length and a certain direction so again, this representation of electric field line or electric field, which is a vector, makes it very possible to draw these electric field lines. All right, so we're gonna have ways of drawing these electric fields and we're gonna have certain rules that we have to follow when we draw electric fields. So we're gonna run through some examples of drawing electric field lines. This is gonna be kind of different than other problems that you've been doing. It's gonna be very graphical and very, uh, very visual. A lot, a lot of drawing involved. So, 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 so again, note, all right, so it's very important that an electric field and we already talked about this, but an electric field is defined for a positive test charge. All right, so we'll say positive test charge Q, little Q. Usually it's little Q for positive test charge oftentimes. And, and so electric field lines point away from a positive charge and toward a negative charge. We talked about this. So the electric field points away from a positive charge. Again, we're talking about the charge in question, the charge of interest. And toward a negative charge. All right, and so, and why is that? Well, again, if we're talking about a charge, capital Q, the charge of interest, and your test charge, little q, is always going to be positive. Well, if capital Q is positive, what's it going to do? Well, positive charge and positive charge are going to do what? It's going to cause the, the test charge to be, to, be, to be repelled away. Hence, the electric field would be defined in that manner it's defined with respect to positive test charge so if the charge here is positive then the electric field is going to be away and if it's negative it's inward right and so what we would see again we're talking about a test charge of interest what we would see is that if we're talking about a positive uh, point charge the electric field is going to be radially outward. If the test charge is positive. If the test charge is negative, the radial, the electric field will be radially inward. Again, these are the description of the electric field. Again, what if the what if it's a larger negative point charge? So in that case, what would happen? Well, we define the number of the number of field lines by the magnitude of the charge. So 
If it's a larger test charge, we'd have more field lines coming in. More field lines. There's a positive point charge. Here's a negative point charge. Here is a negative point charge. of greater magnitude. IE more field lines. So you draw more field lines to represent a large uh, greater charge. Again, field lines from a positive charge of interest are going to be radial out. So, so essentially, by radially outward. So, if I put a positive test charge, it's going to push it away. Electric field lines for a negative point charge of interest are going to be radially inward. A positive test charge would then be attracted. And, uh, and if I want to express a larger electric field, or, uh, or, or sorry, electric field for a point charge of a of a greater magnitude, then I would actually uh, I, I would actually use more field lines. All right, um, so let's, um, let's imagine a positive and negative point charge uh, next to one another. So let's, let me draw a couple more pictures. What if I have charges? What if I have multiple charges? Let's put two, um, pos let's put a positive and negative uh, charge of equal magnitude next to each other. So it happens now. I'm gonna try to map out the electric field. So I'm going to put a positive test charge Q. Well, in fact, let me write down the rules for for drawing for drawing uh, electric field lines, and then I'll I'll get a little bit more complicated. So rules for drawing electric field lines. All right, and then we'll draw, we'll have a couple of more complicated examples and work, and work some uh, problems out to kind of do this. So again, drawing out your field lines is a skill that you have to learn, become more comfortable with it. So what are the rules? Number one, uh, field lines must begin on positive charges and terminate on negative charges. or at infinity uh, for any charge distribution, I'm oh, sorry, um, in the hypothetical case of, an is of isolated charges. That's rule number one. Rule number two, the number of field lines leaving a positive charge
or entering a negative charge. is proportional to the magnitude of the charge. Number three. The strength of the field. is proportional to the closeness of the field lines. More precisely, it's proportional to the number of lines per unit area perpendicular to the lines. More precisely, it is proportional uh, to the number of lines per unit area. actually five rules. I can only fit three, I think, and I'm going to put the other two. So number, number of lines per unit area perpendicular to the line. Okay, so there's five rules. The first three, let's think about them. Field lines must begin on positive charges and terminate on negative charges or at infinity in a hypothetical case of an isolated charge. So again, as we saw, is that, is that you know, when you had a lone positive charge, what happens? Well, the electric field lines are emanate outward from a lone positive charge. <clears throat> Where do they terminate? Well, there's a lone positive charge, so they'll terminate at infinity. Um, <clears throat> on the case of a lone negative charge, Electric field lines will start from infinity and go radially inward toward the negative charge. Number of field lines leaving a positive charge or entering a negative charge is proportional to the magnitude. So again, as I said earlier, the more field lines, the greater the magnitude. And in fact, the strength of the field is proportional to the closeness of the field lines, or, or i.e., the more precisely it's a proportional to the number of field lines per unit area. Remember. Coulomb's law looks like this. All right, so it's proportional to R squared. It's proportional to the area. So the more field lines per unit area, the greater electric field, as so there's an inverse proportionality with respect to area. All right, there are two more rules. So keep these three in mind and Sorry, I have to do this, but again, two more rules. Rule number four. Says um, the direction of the electric field. is tangent to the field line at any point in space. OK. 
Okay, so direction of the electric field is tangent to the field line. It means the direction of the electric field is actually along the field line. So you're actually drawing the electric field direction. And five, five says that field lines can never cross. What number five means is that an electric field is unique. at any point in space. If there's a point in space, where electric field lines cross, then there is an ambiguity in direction. And so the field cannot be unique. So if they cross, there's you don't know which direction, there's a confusion. There must be a unique direction at any point in space. If you have a crossing electric field lines at some point in space, then there's an ambiguity. You don't you don't know which which way is it, this way or this way. You know, you don't know. You have to have it be uniquely defined. Electric field should be unique everywhere in space. Okay, so let's um, let's work uh, some um, examples here. So, prototypical example would be um, two point charges in vicinity of one another. So let's let's do an example following our rules. Let's do an example of two equal equal magnitude but opposite charges. <clears throat> so let's draw a charge plus Q in the vicinity of negative Q. Now, electric field, essentially, I can draw the lines such that, again, the, the electric field is going to start on a positive charge and end on a negative charge. They're the same magnitude. And so depending upon, you know, how many lines I'll draw, I mean, again, the, the field lines must be radially, radially um, uh, outward or inward for point charges. These are point charges, right? And so what we'll, we'll, we'll basically do is we'll have these radial, radial point charges. The question is, where do they go? Well, again, I'll start on a positive and terminate on a negative or an infinity. So again, I'll do that radial, go radial, but again, I'll end up back at, and I'll kind of just, I'll end up right back at a negative charge. So I'll start on a start on a positive charge and on a negative charge. At some point, I'm not gonna be able to reach the reach the charge. So at some point, I'll have electric field lines just going out into space. Okay, so again, it, it, they either terminate at um, a negative charge, electric field lines will always start on a positive charge, so either terminate on a negative charge or at infinity. Now, for a negative charge in our hand, they can start at infinity and terminate on a negative charge, so field lines should always be going in. So again, you have to represent radial field lines. All right, so again, for the case of a positive charge next to a negative charge, the electric field lines will always, they're, they're gonna be radial outward for a positive charge, inward for negative charge. So notice 
then I'm representing radial lines in both cases. Now, the thing is the electric field lines will either terminate on a negative charge or at infinity. So again, I have the radial lines. You know, I mean, if the, if the negative charge is by itself, it would just be radial lines going from infinity. However, some of these radial lines, because it's in a, it's in a close proximity to a, a local positive charge or nearby positive charge, some of those radial lines can come from the actual positive charge. And I try to draw it uniquely because I said they're the same magnitude. So this, this charge has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten radial lines coming out of it. This one hopefully has 10 as well. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes. So I try to draw the same number of, of uh, electric field lines to indicate that the charge magnitudes are the same. What happens if the if the charges have the same sign? Let's 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 take a couple of cases of a uh, of uh, let's say two negative charges, but same magnitude. Well, in this case. Char uh, electric field lines will not emanate from either of these charges. They're both negative. So they're going to be getting field lines, both of them from infinity. And they're not going to have anything near each other. So, you know, in, in the case of, you know, uh, electric field lines coming over here, well, they're going to want to avoid the other charge. And you have to represent every point that would be radially emanating. So, oops, I apologize. Very incorrect here. And trying to represent all radio connections, I guess, if you will, to the charge. And trying to make them the same. They cannot cross. So you notice that the, char the electric field between charges of the same sign, SIGN, is very weak. The electric field between charges of, a, of a opposite signs is very strong. All right, and so again, the electric field between opposite charges is strong, relatively strong. So a lot of field lines in this region, so it's relatively strong. However, the electric field between two charges of the same sign is very weak. There's no electric field in here. So electric field between like charges is very weak. All right, so again, what am I noting here? Well, I know that um, point charges must have Electric field lines that radially that, that radiate either radially outward or inward. Electric field lines for a positive charge rate, uh, radiate radially outward. Electric field lines for a negative charge um, uh, emanate radially inward. Now again, the the charge uh, electric field line will start on a positive charge and terminate on a negative charge or an infinity, depending upon the situation. So in a case where I always have electric field lines emanating from the positive charge. And terminating at the negative charge. But again, it, it, depending upon the vicinity, some of the field lines can reach the uh, go from positive to negative, but other field lines cannot reach. 
So this uh, field lines that uh, radio, you know, radiate away on the other opposite sides of the charges will just go to, uh, will, will just interact with infinity. And here I have a situation where I have two negative charges. The electric field lines can only come into a negative charges. So they're all gonna get their charges from infin at infinity. And I need to represent all the radial spokes, if you will, uh, around the charge. So it depends, you know, I sometimes they'll, they'll be affected by, you know, um, having a real estate issue with the electric field lines from the other charge. Other, in other cases, they'll, you know, they can just radial, they can just um, have a, a, a regular radial spoke that's not affected. Again, I'm trying to follow the rules that I wrote down. <clears throat> so let's work a uh, fairly, fairly simple problem. Let's look, let's look at open stacks 18.36. It talks about field lines. You'll draw some electric field lines yourself. Again, I'm trying to follow the rules that are laid out. <clears throat> open stacks. 18.36. Okay, it says sketched electric field lines uh, in the vicinity of two opposite charges. Where the negative charge is three times greater than the in magnitude than the positive. All right, so <clears throat> sketch the electric field lines in the vicinity of two opposite charges where the negative charge is three times greater than in magnitude than the positive. Okay, so <clears throat> the thing to do here is to be uh, very careful. So I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have say negative three Q. I don't know what the charges are. Whatever they are, they're opposite and I know that the positive charge, whatever it is, I can call it positive Q. And I can say that the negative charge is negative three Q. That's what I'm told here. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna imagine that, just kind of look at magnitudes. I'm gonna imagine drawing, say three lines from the positive charge terminates on the negative charge. Here's line number one, number two, and number three. Okay, so now those are all the lines that I draw from the positive charge. That means that given that the number of field, the number of field lines is again proportional, remember the rules, proportional to the magnitude of the charge. So if I draw three lines emanating out of the positive Q charge, that means I'd have to have three times that or nine lines coming into the negative three Q charge since the negative three Q charge has a magnitude is three times greater. So I need to draw six more lines. One, two, three, four, uh, five, and six. Again, the number of field lines must correspond to the magnitude. So if I'm drawing, again, the field lines should leave a positive charge and either terminate on a negative charge or an infinity. And the number of field lines should be, should be corresponding to the magnitude. Here's a magnitude 1Q, here's a magnitude 3Q. 
So I should have three times the field line. So here I have three field lines for a positive Q. So that I should have three times three, three times in the magnet, I should have nine field lines going into negative three Q. So here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So again, I should have three times as many field lines with respect to negative three Q than with Q. Because negative three Q has a magnitude has three times the magnitude as positive Q. Following these rules. <clears throat> so write it out. There's three lines from positive Q. Nine lines into negative three Q. And again, nine divided by three is three. That's the magnitude. That's why I did that. <clears throat> okay, so now let's go into uh, another topic that's of interest. One, thing, one of the things about OpenStax is that OpenStax was very much into medical application. All right, and so very, you know, again, a lot of the people who take college physics are have uh, interest in medicine or biology. So OpenStax realized that. <clears throat> and so what, one of the things it tries to do is it tries to give you some sort of, um, <clears throat> of um, relevance to biology or biosciences. So there's a lot of electric forces in biology. All right, and so, so essentially, there's uh, large molecules again, you know, this goes into what you guys um, are more interested in, such as protein. and nu uh, nucleic acids and so on um, are usually electrically charged. You know, so basically it's so important to life are usually electrically charged. So a lot of the DNA molecule, for instance, is very electrical. All right, and so DNA itself, the oxyribonucleic acid, the DNA, DNA molecule itself is highly charged. All right, so it's very, very much a, a charged object. It is the electrostatic force that not only holds the molecule together, but also gives the molecule structure and its strength. So what we've been studying, the electrostatic force, what we've just been studying, not only holds the DNA molecule together, but also gives it its, it's uh, structure and strength. It looks the way it is because of the electrostatic force. So that's very interesting. You know what you talk about with the DNA molecules is so important to a lot of your studies. Well, it is, it looks the way it does in many ways because of electrostatics, electrostatic force. 
All right. And so I'll give you a little picture of DNA molecule. All of you know what it looks like, of course. But um, <clears throat> now a DNA molecule, as you know, the four nucleotides, nucleotide bases, Um, are given by the symbols <clears throat> A for adenine or adenine uh, C for cytosine Uh, G for guanine. And T for thymine. Again, just to review, um, um, you know, you guys probably have already, already studied this in your biology class, but the order of the four bases, just for people who haven't studied it, the order of the four bases varies in each strand of the DNA molecule. It makes one DNA molecule different, uh, unique from another. Right. Um, but the pairing between the bases is always the same. So the pairing is always uh, uh, C with G and A with T. That that's what you can um, um, predict, or that's what you can expect. All right, so again, you have these four bases for, a new, uh, for uh, DNA. A for adenine, C for cytosine, G for guanine, and T for thymine. Now, the order of the bases you know, varies with each strand. That, that's what makes one DNA molecule uh, different from another, but the pairing of these bases is always the same. You always have C paired with G and A paired with T. All right, so, and it helps to uh, preserve order um, of the bases when you have cell division. All right, and so the pairing, again, it's kind of, a, I'll give you a little picture in a minute. The pairing uh, C with G and A with T. All right, and so um, helps preserve helps preserve the order of bases in cell division. And cell division is is given a fancy word mitosis. All right, so again, the DNA molecule has certain predictive structures. Now, again, 
What makes one DNA molecule different from another is the order of the bases and the strands. All right, but the pairing of the bases are always the same. So, so how does this have anything to do with force? Well, so essentially, let's let's, uh, let's bring up a picture of the DNA molecule. So I will share my screen in a second here. Give me a, a moment. <clears throat> I don't really like the book's picture of DNA, but it is what it is. All right, so <clears throat> let me share my screen. So what you see here is a picture of a DNA molecule. And you know, you have the various bases that are, you know, near each other, and then you have the strands. All this molecule is being held together by the electrostatic force. That's what makes the molecule look the way it does. And so you know the electrostatic force is inverse proportional to R squared. All right. And so essentially, um, you have to have the distance between the, between the base pairs has to be small enough electrostatic force to be sufficient to hold them together. All right, and so again, if it's too far away, you know, the electrostatic force will not be able to work sufficiently. So, so DNA is highly charged. There's about, you know, in the biology book, it's about two Q sub B e charged per 0 0.3 to the negative nine meters. And the distance separating the strands that make up the DNA molecule is about one nanometer. So again, you have couple, you have two different kind of forces going on. You have the forces between the between the base pairs, then you have the actual forces between the the strands of the DNA molecule, all this is held together by electrostatic um, attraction. All right, and so, so that's what makes the DNA molecule look the way it does and why it behaves the way it does. So let me kind of write a couple more of these things down, then we'll leave the, this little biology topic. So <clears throat> as I said a moment ago, to kind of finish this little topic up since I since biology is not my strength. But I think it's important for you to the takeaway here is that electro uh, um electrostatic attraction is very important in a DNA molecule. So effectively the idea is is since Coulomb's law you know uh is proportional to distance squared basically you know f is proportional to one over r squared as we know <clears throat> the uh distances between the base pairs must be small enough uh, for cool, the electrostatic force to be sufficient. All right, so the very distances between the base pairs must be just right in order to have sufficient electrostatic force in a DNA molecule. All right, and so again, DNA is highly electrical. 
Okay, so again, you know, you have the, the pairing of the bases. The bases have to be at a distance such that, you know, they're, they're actually having, there's be enough attraction. So again, DNA is a highly charged, it's a highly charged molecule. Uh, with about two times Q sub E charge per 0 0.3 nanometer. That's kind of a charge density, if you will. Oh. So that, that much charge, two Q sub E, you know, uh, per 0 0.3, that's a negative nine meters, or 0 0.3 nanometers. Um, the distance separating the two strands Uh, that's on the order of a nanometer. Uh, you know, the two strands make up the DNA molecule, you know, the helix, double helix. Um, is about one nanometer. while the distance <clears throat> separating, and I've said this already, the atoms that make up the bases or the atoms that make up the base, the bases, is about 0 0.3 nanometers. Can these this, given that this is a highly charged molecule and the very size of the molecule and its structure is all determined by the electrostatic force. So little would you know that the very DNA molecules, so, so important in biology is direct application more so than anything else of the electrostatic Coulomb force. All right, and so the electrostatic force does play in your life as um, as bioscientists. All right, um, I want to say more about conductors now. I want you know, so again, conductors are very important in uh, electrostatic phenomena, and I talked about conductors a little bit, but I want I want to focus on them more now really for the rest of this chapter, as we finish the chapter up. So, so let's talk more about conductors and electric fields. And static equilibrium. All right, so the thing about conductors is, you know, there's a, there's a few um, very important situations um, or very important phenomena that, you know, that uh, define conductors. All right, so for one thing, you know, a charge is free to move about.
in a conductor. So let's imagine here for a moment that I have a conductor. And I have a charge that is, let's say, near the surface. And, you know, given that you have electric charge, we know that if you have an electric charge, there's a corresponding electric field. You know, we know that from Coulomb's law. Let's just say in general that I have a generalized electric field in some direction. Now, the electric field will have a parallel component and a perpendicular component. It's a vector. So I say, oh, here's my electric field. Here is the perpendicular component. And here is the parallel component. Well, if I have a parallel component, what it will do is it will um, actually cause the movement of other charges in the, in the conductor. And so essentially, um, if a parallel component of electric field exists, for a charge in a conductor it will exert forces you know f equals q e parallel if you will on other charges since the charges are free to move about a conductor, they will arrange themselves in electrostatic equilibrium. So no forces are felt. by any charge. So they will quickly arrange themselves in what is called electrostatic equilibrium. What that means is that they will arrange themselves so they, that none, none of the charges have any parallel electric field component. They'll arrange themselves in such a way in electrostatic equilibrium where they will only have a perpendicular electric field component. That's the case for conductors. So because of their ability to move around with ease, they can rearrange themselves into electrostatic equilibrium. There's a couple of things that'll, that'll happen here. So charges in a conductor, Again, charges are electrons, they're negative. So in a conductor, charges, which are, i.e. electrons, uh, in a conductor,
are so free to move about the conductor that they'll arrange themselves a couple of different ways. They'll arrange themselves with a couple of different uh, uh, qualities in mind. So they're so free to move about the conductor that they move as far apart from each other as possible. They do not want to be near each other. I mean, given that they have the ability to go as far apart as possible, that means that the charges on the conductor will only reside on the surface of the conductor. Hence, charges on a conductor will only reside on the surface of the conductor or surface or surfaces. No charges inside the conductor. So again, they want, they have the ability to move at will. Hence, they can move to be as far apart from, it, from one another as they can, these charges that are, that are in the conductor, which means that they only reside on the surfaces of the conductor. They have the ability to move as far apart as possible, so they only reside on the surfaces of the conductor. And then, as I just said, um, charges will move to be in electrostatic equilibrium where they will feel or they will exert no force of the form F equals EQ or QE on each other. So charges, so means the electric field emanating from charges on the surface of a conductor only have a perpendicular component. That's it, no parallel component. If they had a parallel component, then they could rearrange themselves such very, very quickly such that they do not any longer. So again, charges on, or electrons in the conductor, they don't wanna be near each other. They have the ability to move any way they like, so they will move to be as far apart from each other as possible. So they, ex they only ex exist on the surface of the conductor surfaces. The other thing is charges will move to be in electrostatic equilibrium where they will exert no force of the form F equals QE on each other. So electric fields emanating from charges on the surface of a conductor only have a, perp a perpendicular component, no parallel electric field components 
for charges in the conductor. Okay, very, very important. So that's um so that's what you know that's a, a case of electric so, so inside of a conductor there is no electric field because all the charges are on the surface and the conductor only has electric field lines perpendicular to its surface. Okay, very important concepts. All right, and so another thing as well is that you may have, so again, that's for excess charge on a conductor. You may have a neutral conductor and you put it in the electric field. So again, the preceding is regarding the placement of excess charge on a conductor and the corresponding electric field. Now, you could place a conductor in electric field. So again, here we're, what we talked about pre previously a moment ago is what happens if you, have, if you have excess charge on a conductor, where does the charge go? Well, it goes to the surfaces and it arranges itself on the surfaces such that the only electric field, electric field um, emanating from the, con uh, uh, from the conductor or uh, you know, um, is going to be perpendicular to the surface of the conductor. Okay, and what happens if you put a neutral conductor in an electric field? So let's imagine that we have an electric field that without the conductor in it is totally parallel. So we have initially a totally parallel electric field. This is my before. So we'll do a before and after picture. So I have electric field lines that are perfectly, perfectly uh, parallel to one another. Okay, before, now I'm gonna stick a spherical conductor in this electric field. Neutral spherical conductor, stick it in the electric field. What's gonna happen now? Well, the electric field lines that are further away will be unaffected. But then electric field lines will start knowing about the conductor. So for instance, this next one might boogie in a little bit. And pretty soon you're gonna have electric field lines going into the conductor. Now they're gonna go into the conductor perpendicular. They enter perpendicularly. They always must interact with the conductor Per, so, so it goes into the surface perpendicularly. And that's one of the rules. You can only have a perpendicular electric field to the surface. 
Well, of course, there has to be a charge associated with each field line. So again, given that the electric field is, is a positive or is for a positive test charge, electric field is going to attract negative charges on one side of the conductor. And of course, electric field lines emanate from the other side in perpendicular. All these are perpendicular, and of course, only positive charges emanate electric fields. So you're going to see that there's going to be a, a separation or polarization of charge in this initially um, neutral conductor. And so electric field lines will be such, but the idea is electric field lines that interact with the conductor must enter the conductor perpendicularly per charge. So it's going to terminate on a charge. In the, in the case, so, so again, electric field, you always got to think about is, is basically um, attracting negative charge or pushing away positive charge. So it's going to attract negative charge on, on, the, on the closer side of the conductor, and it's going to repel positive charge on the other side. The electric field in the conductor itself is zero. So E equals zero. Inside the conductor. That has to be true because um, the, uh, the charges are only ever on the surface. So, given that the charges are only on the surface, there is no electric field inside of a conductor. So, again, electric field emanates off of charges that are in the surface and it emanates perpendicularly. Yeah, so again, the first example I gave is what happened to excess charge on a conductor. Again, the excess charge that is able to move about the conductor, so it wants to be as far away from each other as possible, so that it means the excess charge will reside on the surface. And the um, electric field lines enter or leave the conductor perpendicularly to the conductor. No parallel components. If there was a parallel component, charges would be quickly rearranged such that there would not be a parallel component. If there was a parallel component, there would not be an electrostatic equilibrium. Now, in this other case, we have a, a initially, a originally neutral uh, conductor, connecting sphere in this case, that we put into an originally uniform electric field. So uniform parallel electric field, once you put the, um, the charged conductor in, you affect the electric field. The far enough away electric field does not get affected, but closer in, you see the electric field being affected and then you actually see it either entering the conductor perpendicularly and it has to be on each, has, there has to be a, a negative charge upon, the, um, upon each entry point and it leaves the conductor perpendicularly and there must be a positive charge at each exit point for electric field. Be very important. <clears throat> so let's write down the properties of the conductor really quickly for electrostatic equilibrium based upon what we just got done talking about. All right, so properties uh, of a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium. Three properties. Uh, one, the uh, electric field is zero inside a conductor. I 
Again, why is that? Because electric field, because the charges inside a conductor, you know, say the electrons can move away from it. They're, they're the same signs, so they'll repel each other. They'll move away from each other as far away as they can. So they'll go to the surface or surfaces. That means that inside, you have to have an electric charge, have electric field. Inside the conductor, the electric field is zero. Very important aspect of a conductor. There is no electric field inside a conductor. It's only on the surface. Okay, number two. Just outside a conductor. The electric field lines are perpendicular to its surface. Ending or beginning on charges on the surface. And rule number three, <clears throat> property number three, I should say. <clears throat> Any excess charge resides entirely on the surface or surfaces of a conductor. All right, so I've said all this. Electric field is, is zero inside a conductor. Number one. Number two, just outside a conductor. Electric field lines are perpendicular to its surface, ending or beginning on charges on the surface. Okay, and then three, any excess charge resides entirely on the surface or surfaces of a conductor. All right, so now I want to introduce to you a very important uh, arrangement that we're going to actually use throughout our studies of of a um, of a electromagnetic theory, in particular the electricity portion of it. Now, one question you might ask is, well, you know, I've seen you talk about having parallel electric fields or parallel electric field lines. Well, how do I go about making such such a I mean, how do I make a parallel electric field? How do I make a uniform electric field? So how can we make a uniform electric field? Well, the answer is, we can pair up uh, two parallel charged conducting plates. So how would we go about making this arrangement? Well, we can have the plates be long compared with their distance. So we have one conducting plate. Again, these are plates. So you can think of them as being uh, three-dimensional objects. We're looking, we're looking at straight on, but really the plate extends into the whiteboard. The plate is you know, a long parallel conducting plate. We're just looking at it you know, from, from an end. So we're gonna imagine that there is a set of positive charges on the surface of this plate. 
It's conductors, so these charges must reside on the surface. Now we're gonna put another plate that's negatively charged opposite. So every positive charge, there'll be a corresponding negative charge. <clears throat> What's gonna happen is, well, the electric field must exit perpendicular to the surface. It's a conductor, so that must happen. And it must enter perpendicular to the surface. So that means that I would actually have, well, let's just, let me not worry about the ends. So leaving a positive charge going to negative charge, perpendicular. It must enter, it must leave one, con one conducting plate and enter the other one. Now again, these are supposed to be parallel. So again, these, now the problem is what happens at the end? During, you know, during in the middle portion, you have the nice, um, you have the nice, uh, Feels at the end, you might get what's called fringing. So I leave perpendicular, but I might go out. Again, I leave and enter perpendicularly, but I may bow out. We call that fringing. Again, the electric field lines must be perpendicular, must leave the conductor, must leave the positively charged conductor perpendicularly and enter the negatively charged conductor perpendicularly. And it must be one charge, it must, no, electric field lines must leave a charge and, and, and enter at a charge. So it must leave a positive charge and enter a, ne a negative charge. Should be a one-to-one -one correspondence. Now we consider a long enough, so we, if we consider, so again, this is, uh, these are two, so if we consider, and again, we can imagine there being a distance D between them. <clears throat> if we consider the plates to have an area much greater than the, than the uh, separation distance. Then we can ignore the fringing at the end. And then we would say that we have um, a parallel electric field. Again, this is the electric field. For the most part, we can create a parallel uniform electric field. You know, if we, so we ignore this and say that there is no, we can ignore fringing, that we really will just have a truly parallel electric field. So again, the electric field leaves the positive test, the positive charge and the positively charged plate perpendicularly to the surface as it must because it's a conductor. And given that the, the, the uh, plates are parallel, it will enter the negatively charged plate at a negative charge perpendicular with the electric field being perpendicular to the surface. And you know, given the arrangement, you will then have a nice straight parallel uh, set of electric field lines. And that's, for, so for a parallel plate arrangement like this, two parallel conducting plates in this manner will give you um, nice uniform electric field. That's the way of creating a nice uniform electric field. Now we are going to um, be considering parallel plate arrangements uh, a lot through the um, through this course. And we're going to be going back back to this. In our study of electricity, we're going to be talking about parallel plate arrangements very often. <clears throat> okay, now 
It turns out that the Earth itself has an electric field, relatively uniform. So the Earth has electric fields. Again, this is this deals with conductors. Let's talk a little bit about the Earth real quick. So um, we have a near, uni near uniform electric field on the Earth. So the Earth, so there is a near uniform electric field, <clears throat> we'll say downward electric field on the earth of about um, 150 newtons per coulomb. So the reason being is at around an altitude of about 100 kilometers, so at around 100 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, um, is a layer of charged particles called the ionosphere. A lot of you guys have heard about this. Up in the atmosphere, there's different layers of atmosphere. We have the ionosphere, which is very charged. So in fair weather, I like the weather we're having now. In fair weather, uh, the ionosphere is positive. And the Earth is largely negative. Sustaining this electric field. So again, the long and short of it is, we have kind of sort of like a parallel plate capacitor to some extent, if you think about local flat earth, where we have, you know, 100 kilometers up is a layer of positive charge called an ionosphere. I mean, clearly the earth is round, but for, you know, for a local, you know, like a flat earth approximation, you have the ionosphere 100 kilometers up, you have the earth, which is largely negative, and so again, you're going to have a downward electric field. Uh, electric field lines will leave the ionosphere and enter the Earth. And it'll be going downward because it's going to leave a positive charge and enter a negative charge. So here's a nice example uh, on the Earth, the Earth of uh, having a nice uniform electric field of, of about 150 newtons per coulomb. Okay. Now, 
we want to go and generalize now, you know, with uh, electric field. So again, when we talk about electrostatics, let's, let's talk about the problem we're, we're looking for here. So in general, I'm gonna generalize things as we finish up this chapter here. So in general, in electricity, we want, we are given a charge distribution. And we want to calculate the electric field. at some point in space. So that's in general what we want to do. So we have some sort of a charge distribution. Call it rho of R. Some sort of a charge distribution. And we want to ask ourselves, well, at some point in space, say here, what is E? What is that? Because there's a charge distribution, there needs to be an electric field. So this is generally a very hard problem. We don't, you know, in, to, to do this problem in general is difficult. What we know how to do, so we know how to do this problem right now, if the charge distribution is a point charge. So what we know how to do right now is this problem. This is what we've been studying all night is or in this in this lecture is that, well, the charge distribution I'm asking for is, well, I don't know the general charge distribution, but I know how to do the problem if the charge of interest is a point charge. Because if I ask what's electric field here, I know what it is. You know, there's a point to point, uh, distance R and electric field is going to be given as K Q over R squared R hat. This is the only problem I really know how to do right now. I really know how to do if I have a point charge, capital Q is a charge of interest, I know how to find electric field at some point in space. But I really want to understand in general that I have a charge distribution, a general charge distribution, give my some function, and I want to be able to find a point in space, or the electric field at a point in space. That's the more general problem that I want to do. I know, the only problem I know how to do right now is if that charge, of, if that charge distribution of interest is, if that charge distribution of interest is just a point charge, capital Q. So, okay, I know how to do, if the charge of interest is capital Q, I know how to find the electric field at some point in space. I want to generalize and say, well, what about for a general charge distribution? What is electric field at some point in space? That's the general question I'm trying to answer. And that is where we have to go into a more general, generalized law of physics. So we're, we will now discuss our first ever Maxwell equation. Okay, so this particular, so to, in order to be able to do this problem, I need the first Maxwell equation. 
All right. And so that's the motivation as to why I'm trying to do this. So the first, the first Maxwell equation is called Gauss law for electricity. So this is the first of the four Maxwell equations that govern or that are the laws of physics forming the basis of electromagnetic theory. Okay, so we're gonna try to, to understand in general, how do I find an electric field at some point in space given the charge distribution? You know, this is gonna seem a little bit esoteric to you at first. One of the first things that we, end up, we need to also understand that there's a special constant of the universe called epsilon naught. Okay, it's given the value of 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 um, coulombs per newton meter squared. It is called the permittivity constant. Of free space. This is a constant that is extremely important, a universal constant that's extremely important in electrostatics. A permittivity constant of free space. Now it's gonna be very important for, for Gauss's law. So now to remind ourselves of Gauss's law, let's remind ourselves here that, again, I talked about this in uh, physics one, but there are two ways to multiply vectors. Remember talking about vectors here. Let's just kind of make an aside. So there are two ways to multiply vectors. Now again, I, I talk about this in lectures back in uh in, in for physics one. I'll review it here. So we have one way is a vector times a vector gives a scalar. Okay, I need I need information to do Gauss's law. So that is called a scalar product. or we sometimes call it a dot product. Now again, people who have taken me before have seen this concept. So I take two vectors in space, say A and B are two vectors in space. And, there, and there's an angle between them of theta. The dot product is literally A dot B you know, I would actually, I would actually call this, if I were to stay, say it, I would say A dot B. That's how I would say it. A dot B, there's a two vectors. To do A dot B, you take the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between them. 
So A times B times the cosine of theta. This is the scalar product. It is basically taking a vector times a vector. There's two ways to multiply vectors. This is a vector times a vector giving a scalar. All right, so vector times a vector gives a scalar. Uh, an example of this back in physics one was work. Work was the force dot product with the displacement. Okay, so to, to remind you, this is a good, so work again is an energy. It is a scalar, energies are scalars. And so you take two vectors in with this dot product, you get a scalar out. This is just a scalar. This is the magnitude of A. Take, I took the hat off the vector to indicate it's just the length of the vector, the magnitude. The length of the vector, its magnitude. Times the magnitude of B, again, another number, times the cosine of theta, which is again, another real number. Two vectors in, a scalar out. And so again, we're, we're about to use the dot product with Gauss's law. That's why I'm talking about this. But while I'm at it, let's quickly review the other way of doing multiplication of vectors because that's also gonna be very important to electromagnetic theory. And that is the vector product. So that's gonna be a vector times a vector gives a vector. That might be what you might, that might be uh, what you might uh, expect. Multiply two vectors to get a vector back. That's my, but it's different than what you, it, what you may think, except for the people who, who've had me before. So again, this is sometimes called the vector product or the cross product. So it uses the cross buck form of the multiplication. I would say A, so again, I'd go back to my two vectors, A and B. With an angle theta. A two vectors drawn on a whiteboard, A and B with an angle theta. I would say, instead of the dot, I would use the cross buck. A cross B. I would literally say A cross B. That's how, it's, that's how I would say it. What is it? <clears throat> A cross B is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the sine of the angle between A and B, sine of theta, in a direction perpendicular to the plane formed by A and B According to the right hand rule, so if I'm thinking about, you know, I drew the uh, A and B in the plane of the whiteboard, again, the um, perpendicular to the whiteboard is either out or in. There's a two-fold ambiguity. Which is it? Well, it depends on the right-hand rule. So again, I, I read the, uh, the vector product left to right. I line my fingers up with the first vector, A, and I cross it into the second vector. I curl it toward the second vector, and where my thumb points, in this case, into the board, that's the direction the vector is going. So it's either out of the board or into the board? Well, given I go A cross B, it's into the board. Okay, so A cross B is into the board.
What about B cross A? Again, it would be magnitude of B times magnitude of A times the sine of the angle. But what, what would it be now according to the right-hand rule? Well, again, I, I read left to right. I curl my fingers with direction of B and I curl them toward the second one, A, and my thumb points straight out. So again, B cross A, I curl toward the second one. So I, I line my fingers up on my right hand with the first vector, which would be B as I read left to right. I curl the fingers toward the second vector, which would be A, and where my thumb points is the direction of, of, the, of the actual cross prop. So this would be out of the board. Now, thing about it is, you know, we always take commutivity of multiplication for a given with real numbers, but it turns out that commutivity in general, higher math fails. So in higher math, for higher mathematical objects, like vectors and matrices, commutivity, commutivity of multiplication generally fails. What I mean by that is that A times B is generally not equal to B times A. All right, so A times B is not equal to B times A. Now, of course, for, for uh, real numbers, it's always equal. But for matrices and vectors, it's almost not, it's almost um, never equal. In fact, cross products are anti commutative. I.e., A cross B is actually equal to negative. B cross A. And we saw when I when I did it one way, the vector was into the board, and I did it the other way, I did the cross product the other way, it was out of the board. So they are actually anti-commutative. If I switch the order, I switch the direction of the of the cross product vector. Okay, so why am I talking about this now? Well, again, I'm gonna need cross products a lot in this class because the magnetic field. In fact, if I write down the magnetic force, I gave you part of the magnetic force, and I gave you the first term, I gave the electric term, Q times Z. Well, the magnetic term is actually a cross product. So anywhere you have magnetism, you have a cross product. You cannot avoid it. Magnetism is, always comes with a cross product. So we will be doing a lot of cross products in this class. Not quite yet. But I'm about to do a dot product. So let's go back to Gauss's law. So Gauss's law of electricity so first of all as a piece of history that I think you ought to know is Gauss who is Gauss well Gauss just as a thing is He's a German mathematician and physicist. His name is Carl Friedrich Gauss. Okay. He is possibly the greatest mathematician in history.
So they call him the Prince of Mathematicians. He's from Germany. He's actually a hero in Germany. I mean, he's uh, he was actually on German money. So yeah, one of the Deut before the German uh, for the Germany went to the Euro, uh, they had the Deutschmarks, and Carl and Carl Friedrich Gauss was on the uh, on the Deutschmark. So the Germans revere him very much. Um, <clears throat> he was also a mathematical prodigy. So he was doing calculus by about the age of four. He also had other great, uh, amazing mental abilities like an eidetic memory. He was a lightning calculator. means he can actually calculate two very large numbers and come up with an answer instantaneously. He didn't even know how he did it. If you were to give him two gigantuan numbers, boom, he gave you the answer. He has no idea how he even arrived at the answer. So he was one of the great, his, he was actually, it's interestingly enough that his father was a bricklayer. His father was practically illiterate, had no interest in raising a, a mathematical prodigy. Gauss actually corrected his father's uh, taxes. He was like about five years old. So the Duke of Brunswick, who was uh, one of the uh, noblemen um, at the time, discovered Gauss and realized that you don't want to waste somebody like Gauss on doing some sort of a mundane job. He belongs as a professor someplace. So Gauss had a very successful, very prolific life as a very successful, brilliant physicist and as a brilliant mathematician. <clears throat> you uh, see it, him all over the place. Two of the Maxwell equations are named for him. Um, we have what's called a Gaussian distribution, a bell-shaped curve is actually named after Gauss as well. So Gauss is responsible for this particular law of physics, and we will also see that there is a Gauss's law for magnetism as well. Let's write down this will, it's going to seem like a little bit of an esoteric um, statement here, but let's just imagine here that I have a generalized body. I have a charged body. Okay, so this body is a charged body, and I'm going to imagine that I can, I'm looking at the surface of the body and I'm just gonna pick some little tiny area of that surface. Pick a little area on that surface. And I'm gonna look at the area normal. Remember the area in physics is a vector and it's given, this direction is given as, as the normal. Again, I'll talk about that a little bit in a second here. And let's say that there is an electric field at some angle, at some area. So again, I'm looking at a generalized area. There's a sample area of, of a generalized charged object. Doesn't necessarily have to be a conductor, it's just a charged object, okay? Now, an area, an air, area is a vector whose direction is the normal to the surface. Remember, anybody who's had me before, normal means 
perpendicular to a surface. That's what normal means, All right? And so what I'm looking at is a small area on the surface of this, of this body. And I just want to consider what are the, what's the, nor, the area and then particularly the direction of the normal and what is the direction in the, in the magnitude of the electric field at this? And I, and I, and I, wanna, I wanna make this um, area be so small that I can actually represent it by just a single electric field on a single area vector. So again, these areas are so small. In fact, they should be differential. They should, they should, they should almost approach zero, they're so small. All right, so Gauss's law, so again, I want to, I want to express So I want to so we want to express the entire surface um, as divided up into these small, really differential area elements. All right, and so what I really want to do is imagine an area one, an area two, an area three, you know, zillions of these, this might be some area I, one, two, three is counting number. So this would be say E sub I and A sub I. So I really wanna look at all the different areas. I literally wanna cover the entire surface of this charged object and, and look at the area normal and the electric field at each and every one of these areas. And I want to do, and Gauss's law is the following. Gauss's law says if I sum up, again, summation over I, I'm summing up I as a counting number, one, two, three, da, da, da. If I sum up over I of E sub I, electric field through this very small little area, and I take the dot product with A sub I, the corresponding area normal there, I add up the E sub I, the I sub I, so I add up E1 dot A1 plus E2 dot A2 plus E3 dot A3. Every single do the dot product of the electric field in the area, in the area for every single area, every single small area, and I add up all the areas across the entire surface of, of, the, of this, of this um, charged object. I literally add up over the entire surface of the charged object and add up the dot products of the, of the electric field there with the area normal there. I do that entire addition about the entire surface. So again, over the entire surface. The miracle is that it is equal to the charge that's enclosed divided by epsilon naught. And again, this surface, I wanna imagine a very, very, very thin skin all across this, this surface. This surface is called a Gaussian surface. What I really wanna do is imagine a very, very I mean, I'm, I'm basically adding oh, across the entire surface, considering a skin that's just over the surface. This is called a Gaussian surface. So I'm gonna add up over the entire surface. The, uh, I'm gonna divide the surface into a whole bunch of these little areas, little rectangular areas. Very, very small, almost to be differential. And I wanna add up the dot product of the electric field with the area normal 
over the entire surface of this charged object. The miracle is it's equal to the enclosed, the charge is enclosed within the Gaussian surface divided by epsilon naught, that permittivity of free space. This is always true. It, there's never an exception to it. This is called Gauss's law of electricity. <clears throat> this um, left-hand side is oftentimes called the flux. It's the electric flux. So V is called the electric flux. This is capital V. In the Greek letter V. So the entire flux of electric field through a charged surface or through the surface, the entire surface of a charged object is equal to the charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught. That's what Gauss's law states. That is the way to figure out the electric field in general for if you know if you know the, the, the charge distribution. Now, generally speaking, this, this is a very difficult calculation to do. And again, you know, I'm drawing it more like almost like the college physics form, but I really want to imagine, I want to consider the area elements to be infinitesimal, an infinite number of them. So we want to consider smaller and smaller and more numerous area elements. So in general, you need calculus into this problem. Gauss's law in general will look like the surface integral. This is, you know, when you when you do a summation for infinitesimal areas, you must now do what's called integral calculus. So the surface integral of E dot product with a differential dA. You know, I, I exchanged the delta for a D because I want to I, I want to literally consider areas so small as to be differential is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. That is a generalized Gauss's law. Again, summing up the dot products of the electric field in the area normal all across the entire surface area of the charged object in such a way as to consider differential areas. So you need to use integral calculus. And the right hand side still becomes the charge enclosed in the Gaussian surface of by epsilon naught. We will use Gauss's law a couple different ways in this class in a very important manner. So <clears throat> So again, this is a general law of physics. Why is Gauss's law true? Nobody knows, but it is always true. And the beauty is, if you know the charge distribution, you get the electric field and vice versa. Now, can we use Gauss's law for, let's say, a simple case? Well, again, Gauss's law is difficult to calculate. You know, you know, you have this generalized object like like this. It's very difficult to calculate. It's easiest to calculate for for uh, distributions of very high symmetry. So let's consider conditions uh, cases of high symmetry. So Gauss's law is most easily calculated. for conditions or situations with high symmetry. So let's consider a charged sphere. We'll 
take a highly symmetrical situation, a charge conducting sphere. And I, I, I looked at a generalized charge. I did not say conductor when I just talked about Gauss's law. What I want to do now is I want to consider a charge conducting sphere. So I want to do I want to do a specific case now. All right. So what we have is a spherical conductor. Now let me draw a little bit to the right here. I have a spherical conductor. Okay, radius, let's say capital R. Now, anywhere along this sphere, the area normal will always be along a radial. And so let's let's take a look. That's the radius, that's the area normal. Now, the electric field. <clears throat> Well, given that electric field must be perpendicular to a conductor, it is also along a radial. All right, and so if I'm looking at a, at a conducting sphere, again, you know, um, A sub I, the area normal is out a radial for a sphere, that's just from the geometry. Also, the E sub I, the electric field, is uh, along a radial since the electric field must emanate perpendicularly from a conduct from the surface of a conductor and we're talking about a sphere so the surface so again perpendicular to the surface is going to be along a radial that's a rule for being a conductor So the area normal and the electric field are both along a radial. They are aligned, okay? And so what that basically means is that I, I go back to Gauss's law. Gauss's law says what? Well, Gauss's law will say that I sum up over I, I, I divide my, I divide my spherical surface into many, many um, little area patches, and I sum over these patches. So I say E sub I dot A sub I is equal to Q and close. We'll say. We'll say that this uh, spherical conductor has a has, a, um, has a, um, a charge of capital Q divided by epsilon naught. Okay, so I just said that for any <clears throat> that for any area for any area patch. A sub I and E sub I are both along a radial. So these vectors are parallel. 
So if I talk about, in general, some E sub I dot A sub I, two vectors, well, again, it's gonna be the magnitude of E sub I times the magnitude of A sub I times the cosine of the angle between them. But what is the angle between them? Well, they're parallel. So it's gonna be the cosine is zero degrees. Cosine is zero degrees is one. So that means that I could take a dot product calculation and exchange it for an ordinary calculation of just the magnitudes. Since in this particular highly symmetrical situation, you know, and with and, and given that it's a conductor, and I know that E sub I is also a long radial because it has to be perpendicular to a conductor surface, then I can actually exchange this dot product for an ordinary product. So because of this logic. I can write the following. I can write that the summation over I of magnitude E sub I times magnitude A sub I is Q over epsilon naught. <clears throat> now, I make another argument to the symmetry. There is no reason to believe that the electric field is different from one point or electric field magnitude, I'll say, well, let's say electric field. Electric field, well, I'll say magnitude, is different for different parts of the spherical surface. I have no reason to believe that, you know, as I as I sample different parts of the spherical surface, there's no reason for me to believe that electric field magnitude one place would be different from another. Why would it be? That means that I really don't have to worry about the electric field changing along a surface. It's not going to change. Electric field is going to be a constant. So in that case, electric field is a constant. About the Gauss, about the surface of the sphere, so I can write that the summation over I of a constant E times A sub I is Q over epsilon naught. Okay, so now I have a constant electric field magnitude. Now, the thing is, one of the things I can actually do is I can pull out the electric field magnitude outside the summation. So let me show you why I can do that. So I can actually write that this becomes E times the summation over I of a sub i goes q over epsilon naught. So again, if I have a magnitude multiplying uh, something that does change, you know, in a summation, I can pull the mag I can pull that constant value out. So for instance, I'll give you an example. Let's say I add up two 
plus four, plus six, plus eight. Now I can just add them up and I can realize that, well, two plus four is six, plus another six is 12, plus eight is 20. But I could say, you know, I noticed that there is a factor of two everywhere. So this is really two times one plus two times two plus two times three plus two times four. Why well, I see this constant multiplying everything through, why, I, why don't I just pull it out? So I'll pull out the constant, which is two, and I'm left with what? One plus two plus three plus four. Well, one plus two is three plus three is six plus four is 10 times two is 20. So I get the same thing. I can, if I see that there's a constant factor in a summation, I can pull that constant factor out. So that basically means that I could pull this E, this is constant number, I can pull it out of the summation. So now I have, a, I have another question. I'm left now with a constant E times a summation over all the area elements of crop over a sphere. And then of course the right-hand side has to change curve up, so not no, if I if I add all surface area elements all about an entire sphere, what is that? <clears throat> That's the surface area of the sphere, is it not? So what's the surface area of the sphere? Well, summation over I of A sub I, well, the surface area of the sphere of radius R from your geometry is four pi R squared. So I can actually write this as E times four pi R squared is Q over epsilon naught. <clears throat> Or that becomes E. I'm looking for the electric field, right? It's going to be Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared. Or write it like this. One over four pi epsilon naught times q over r squared. Now that looks very similar to the formula for a point charge. So I use Gauss's law to derive electric field for um, a charge conducting sphere. So let's take a look at something here. So again, what did I do? I started off by looking at Gauss's law in general. I then said, well, because the because we're talking about a sphere, we have very high symmetry. So the area normal will always be along a radio. But because the sphere is conduct is a conductor, electric field is always perpendicular to the conducting surface, which means electric field is also everywhere going to be along a radio. So that means that the area normal and the electric field at every single area patch across, uh, over the entire um, conducting sphere will be um, parallel to each other. And so given that um, I, you know, parallel um, vectors have a zero degree angle between them, the dot product then becomes a simple multiplication. E sub i times a sub i. I also do not have any reason to believe that the electric field, you know, due to due to symmetry, electric field at any point along uh, over the conducting sphere should be different than any other point. Electric field is constant then with that argument, and again, constant times uh, a summed value. Well, I can pull the constant out if it's inside of a summation, as I just showed you, and of course, the summation of all area patches over a um, over a spherical surface is just four pi r squared. The surface area of a sphere is four pi r squared, where r is the radius. So I can, instead of writing this, I have E times the surface area of a sphere is q over epsilon naught, or I can write this as E is 
one over four pi epsilon naught times q over r squared. Okay, so we now have used Gauss's law to derive a formula for the for the electric field over conducting sphere. So let's look at this a little more carefully now. So we have used Gauss's law We've used Gauss's law of electricity. Um, to formulate the electric field outside or at the at the surface, if you will, of a charge conducting sphere with excess charge Q. and radius R. It is given as the electric field is one over four pi epsilon naught Q over R squared. Well, that's funny. What is one over four pi epsilon naught? Well, one over four pi epsilon naught is one over four pi, and then times 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 um, coulombs over Newton meter squared and lo and behold this value becomes 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meters squared per coulomb, which I remember as that constant K that I talked about earlier in this lecture. So what I just got done deriving is that the electric field is K Q over R squared, which is exactly as if all the charge was located at at a point at the center of mass. So again, this is exactly deriving Coulomb's law. I have derived Coulomb's law for electric field from Gauss's law. And so you can see the validity of Gauss's law and then I was able to derive Coulomb's law from it. So this is, this is as if all of the charge Q was a point mass at the center of mass. Of sphere. So the beauty here is I have used Gauss's law to derive Coulomb's law, all right? And so so we have used Gauss's law of electricity derive Coulomb's law. Or uh, 
the electric field of a point charge. That's a very important calculation. And this validates Gauss's law, number one, but the other thing is it shows you that the more general law of the universe is Gauss's law, given that I can derive Coulomb's law from it. So again, it shows you the power of Gauss's law. Now, Gauss's law is generally applicable, but again, you know, the, the issue is it's very hard to calculate unless you're talking about very high symmetrical situations. Okay. Um, let's give one example, one, one uh, Gauss's law problem. I don't really have any good problems out of OpenStax for this. I'm going to use a Cutnell Johnson problem. <clears throat> so again, let's look at Cutnell Johnson 18.54. So this is right out of your book. Uh, it says a spherical surface completely surrounds a collection of charges. Find the electric flux through the surface of the collection. I'm sorry, find the electric flux um, if the collection consists. of a, <clears throat> a single positive 3.5 transcending six Coulomb charge. B, a single, Negative 2.3 times 10 negative 6 Coulomb charge. And uh, C, both of the charges in A and B. Okay, so the important thing to keep in mind here is that, yes, I mean, I, I was drawing a Gaussian in the last uh, uh, example that I did, I was drawing a Gaussian surface as a very, very thin skin about the conducting sphere. But I actually have the ability to draw a Gaussian surface over any collection of charges. So I can take, a, you know, in this particular case, I can take a point charge and draw a Gaussian surface around it and I would do myself a favor, if it's just a point charge, I can do myself a favor of just drawing a Gaussian surface of a sphere around the point charge. And particularly if I wanna figure out how, um, how uh, what the electric field is at a distance from that point charge, I would draw a sphere 
whose radius corresponds to that distance. All right, and so I have the ability to do that too. I mean, I, I, I really want to draw a Gaussian surface um, consistent with the distance from which I want to I want to actually uh, evaluate the electric field. All right, and so in this particular case, I'm really looking at drawing a spherical Gaussian surface around particular point charges. So in the first case, again, I'm, what am I looking at? Well, I'm looking at a point charge or some sort of a charge oh, it's capital P right there, of interest. And I really want to know um, in general, you know, let's say at a distance R away, well, if I want to know that, then I can say, well, I'll just draw a Gaussian surface about this point charge. And I'm considering a distance R away. So again, this is my spherical Gaussian surface. About the point charge. I want to consider it for any general distance r. All right. And so in so doing, it's not here, it's just the surface. So in so doing, well, what's Gauss's law? I mean, now, for instance, now I'm Gauss's law is going to tell me what? It's the sum over all little area patches I of E sub I dot A sub I, and that's Q enclosed, the charge enclosed in the Gaussian surface, divided by epsilon naught. And that is what I'm talking about here. So I'm picking a Gaussian surface that happens to have a lot of, uh, has high symmetry. It's just like I said, Last time, um, <clears throat> you know, with the same argument, you know, E sub I, in this particular case, it's not ha having to deal with the conductor, E sub I is radial for a point charge. I mean, it's radial for a different reason. Um, it is also, E sub I, is also the same at any distance R. So we, we can call it E. And again, A sub I is normal, is, uh, is the normal, so it is, that's the area normal, always perpendicular to the surface. So it is uh, parallel to a radial, always. And so we would, what we would have here is that we would have, um, again, Gauss's law could be, could be now, uh, because of these arguments that I just made, um, you know, we know that the, the vectors are parallel. So I can actually write this as just constant E, or the magnitude E times A sub I, is Q enclosed over epsilon naught. And again, for the same reason, I can pull, I have the constant times times uh, some variable. Well, the constant get pulled out of the summation for the reason I gave earlier. <laughs> so 
I could pull the vector field out, sum over i of a sub i, all the little area patches over the entire spherical Gaussian surface, q enclosed over epsilon naught. And of course, if I add up all this, all the area patches all, all, all about a spherical Gaussian surface, well, I would be getting the surface area of a sphere again. And so we know what that is. The surface area of a sphere is or pi r squared <clears throat> is q enclosed over epsilon naught. And of course, in this particular situation, I have also derived Coulomb's law for a point charge. One or four pi epsilon naught comes Q enclosed over R squared, or and of course one over epsilon naught is K. So again, I I know that for this particular situation, I can also use the same arguments, but for different reasons. You know, the radial electric field is because it's a point charge this time, not because it's a, a conducting surface, and the radial um, areas is the same because it's a sphere. So again, that, that is a geometry. So, but in this particular problem, we want to look at things a little bit differently. We want to actually look at the flux con concept. What I want is I want to find electric flux. So again, I'm showing you this because I know that we can actually derive Coulomb's law directly for a point charge with this argument. But we don't have to actually do that here. For this particular problem, what we really want is the electric flux. Well, that is the entire electric flux. That is the left-hand side of Gauss's law. So I can actually say that capital phi, the flux, which is left-hand side of Gauss's law, is simply Q enclosed, the charge enclosed in the Gaussian surface, divided by epsilon naught. And so literally, the left-hand side simply becomes the flux. That's what I'm trying to calculate. So for part A, Q enclosed is simply going to be positive 3.5 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. So what do I do? Well, the flux electric flux q close for epsilon naught. So it's simply going to be positive 3.5 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs divided by 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 um, coulombs squared or a newton meter squared. And I find that in this particular case, that the flux is going to be um, positive 3.95 times 10 to the fifth Newton meter squared per coulomb. Part B, it's really easy. The charge, I just changed the charge. So part B, well, now I have negative 2.3 times 10 negative 6 coulombs. So again, this becomes negative 2.3 times 10 negative 6 coulombs, which means over here, this becomes negative 2.3 times 10 negative 6 coulombs doing the same calculation. And over here, this becomes negative 2.60 times 10 to the fifth Newton meter square per coulomb. So I'm just literally changing out the charge. I'm enclosing another charge. Now, um, I wanna put both charges together. So I'm gonna have both charges sitting in the middle. And what the, what's Q enclosed going to be now? Well, now 
uh, Q and closed will be, so we'll both charges in, Q and closed will be the sum of the charges. So it'll be um, positive 3.5 times 10 to the negative six coulombs minus 2.3 times 10 to the negative six coulombs. So my Q and close, if I just add up these charges, one positive, one negative, my Q and close for part C, <clears throat> the overall charges inside the effective charge is going to be um, uh, 1.2 times 10 to the negative six coulombs. So then my flux will be Q and close reps an hour. Now, positive 1.2 times 10 to the negative six coulombs. Uh, divided by epsilon naught, which is uh, <clears throat> 8.85 times 10 to the ne negative 12 Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. And I find out that in this particular case, the flux um, with both charges in there will be positive 1.36. Uh, times 10 to the fifth. Newton meter squared per coulomb for flux. All right, so that's all that's to it. Literally, that you know, you 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 calculate the flux, you really only have to worry about the charge enclosed in the Gaussian surface divided by epsilon naught. Now that is a generalized Maxwell equation, Gauss's law of electricity. It literally can be used to solve, to say that if I have a generalized electric uh, charge distribution, I can calculate the electric field anywhere in space. Now, the, the, the negative is that um, some of these calculations are going to be very, very difficult to do, if not impossible. You need to to use Gau Gauss's law effectively uh, or easily at least or or you know at all you want to try to consider a situation with high symmetry so i said i we considered a situation where we had a uh, uh, spherical conducting uh conducting uh, or uh, or conducting sphere charge conducting sphere i should say and the other one was the point charge again two situations of very high symmetry okay now we've been considering high, highly symmetrical situations, but what if we have non-symmetrical conductors? So what if we consider electric fields on uneven surfaces. What happens then? What happens if we don't have the symmetry? So, you know, so again, so far, you know, we have, we have considered excess charges on smooth symmetrical conductor surfaces. So far, you know, we consider surfaces that are smooth, surfaces that are also um, symmetrical. Now, what happens if we if, if we don't uh, do that? So, for instance, um, 
excess charges, if we if we uh, if we relax this uh, situation, well, excess charges on non on a non uniform conducting on a non uniform conductor. Um, become concentrated at the sharpest points. Okay, so <clears throat> And also excess charge may move on or off of a conductor at its sharpest points. Okay, and so, um, I mean, basically, why does this happen? And so, you know, again, I say so far we've considered ex excess charge on smooth symmetrical conductor surfaces. Um, however, you know, excess charges on non uniform conductor become concentrated at the sharpest points. So now we're going to talk about conductors that maybe may have points to them or sharp or, or sharp corners. And so. In, in fact, you have a sharp, sharp enough point, you can have ex, you can actually have excess charge moving on or off the conductor at that sharpest point. All right, and so let's consider some examples here. Again, we're gonna look at some examples of, of a, um, well, well, first of all, we'll talk about what, you know, let's say um, draw a conductor that's, Maybe fatter or rounder at the end here, maybe more pointed. It's not symmetrical. Now, what happens here is that if you have excess charge, the excess charge wants to, wants to go to the surface. But the thing is, when you have when you have a nice flat area, you have the ability to spread out and, you know, you're doing a little um, electrostatic equilibrium, you have the ability to, uh, to move about much more easily than in a concentrated area. <laughs> so in a, so um, in a um, region that has, uh, I would say high curve or uh, low curvature, i.e. flat, uh, excess charge can more easily move about. in reaching electrostatic equilibrium. And so in sharp corners, uh, this does not happen. And also, the electric field uh, 
must always be perpendicular to the conducting surface. So again, have ch charges that represent that, that uh, these perpendicularly uh, emanating fields. So the issue, what you, what you have here is a greater concentration of electric charge at the sharp corners. So for instance, you'll have, let's say, you know, if I'm if um if I have excess positive charge. Well, I can more easily spread out the charge on the flat part, but along the um, along the concentrated part or the sharp corner, I have to concentrate the charge as much more. And so what I what I have essentially then is for every charge there will be an emanating electric field that is perpendicular. but there's a greater concentration of charge at the sharper corners. Again, the electric field lines must always be perpendicular to the surface of the conductor. But I have a much better, a much easier way of distributing charges over a flatter region than in a highly concentrated region. Now, I could also have a situation where, let's say the, the same body is inside of a uniform electric field. So what would happen then? Again, it'd be the same situation. Draw this picture again. let's say I have a uniform electric field. Well, again, as I get closer, but then as I'm gonna see is I'm gonna have, again, uh, enter electric field such that it um, goes in perpendicularly, but in the place where it is more concentrated, I'll need more field lines coming out. All right, and so again, you'll see again, you know, the situation where you're gonna have more electric field lines um, in a place where there's a sharper corner than in an area that's that's flatter. Again, same kind of deal when you have a conductor of this of this nature uh, inside of what would be a, a uniform electric field. Now we have some good applications for this. One application is called a lightning rod. So, so you know, there, sometimes you do want to. Uh, you know, uh, have uh, charges that are able to be bled off. So for instance, we have the lightning rod. A lot of times tall buildings will have a lightning rod on top. So how's the lightning rod work? Well, what, do you, what you have essentially you have um, You know, a, a conductor. Again, that's what we're studying here are conductors. But it's very sharp, has a very sharp point. And so along the regions where it's very flat, you know, for instance, you can have, you know, um, very spread out charges. 
along the very flat region. But when you get near the uh, sharp corner, you have a lot of concentration of charge. And so essentially, you know, again, the um, electric field line is always perpendicular to the um, surface. And again, they spread out much more easily along a flat surface, but you have a lot more concentration of charges at a uh, point on, this, on, on, on an area that has a very sharp, sharp point. Again, this electric field. Now, why might you want a lightning rod? Well, say for instance, you know, on a on a very um, so lightning rods work best when they're pointed. So you imagine, for instance, that you know a large uh, concentration of of charge. forms in a storm cloud. So a lightning rod can enable charge to slowly bleed from a storm cloud. So I guess a lightning rod at the top of a building can slowly bleed, uh, uh, can enable charge to slowly bleed from a storm cloud. To prevent a much more dramatic strike of a building. You know, tall buildings are always going to be a threat to, say, a lightning strike from a storm. And so what you can do is you can have a lightning rod on top of the building that slowly bleeds charge out of the storm cloud and allows a much less, I mean, you're going to get struck anyway, but a much less dramatic strike because you bled away some of the charge from the storm cloud. Okay, so, so again, that's, that's the case where you want to facilitate the, uh, the exchange of charge from a conductor. So charges will literally leave or enter the conductor uh, in, a, in a lightning in a lightning rod, you know, because you have a very very uh, you have a very uh, sharp corner, very sharp tip. Okay. Um, now that's the case where you want to facilitate uh, transfer of charge from a, to or from a conductor, but you sometimes. We wish um, to prevent the transfer of charges rather than facilitate it. Okay, so sometimes you want to do that. In that case, um, the conductor should be smooth and have a large radius of curvature as possible. So in this case, the conductor should be smooth instead of pointed. And have as large a radius curvature as possible.
like uh, smooth surfaces of a high voltage transmission line. So again, if you don't want to uh, facilitate the exchange of charge to or from a conductor, you want to make the conductor be, be smooth and have high curvature. On the other hand, if you do want to facilitate uh, charge going to and from a conductor, you want to make it have high curvature in, in sh you know, sharp corners. So again, you know, in the case of a lightning rod. So again, it depends on, on what you want to accomplish. Okay. Now, um, there's another interesting concept I'd like to talk about briefly, and that's called the Faraday cage. So a Faraday cage, named after Michael Faraday, we'll talk a lot about him, a Faraday cage, Um, is a metal shield uh, that encloses a volume okay so um So all electric field will um, reside on the surface of the shield. And um, there will be no electric field inside the volume. So for instance, um, as an example, is, is a typical example of a Faraday cage. Uh, during a thunderstorm, one of the safest places to be is in your car. The metal um, structure of the car acts as a Faraday cage. If lightning strikes, the um, internal volume will be unaffected. So again, the, the car, which is generally made out of metal, will actually act as a Faraday cage. Lightning will strike your car. However, the, the car, the metal is a conductor. 
the charges, the electric field will be entirely on the surface of the uh, struck of, of the of the body of the car, leaving you, the passengers, are leaving the internal volume unaffected. So the Faraday cage uh, can protect you uh, from a lightning strike and a thunderstorm. You won't feel anything. You'll be, I mean, it'll, it'll all be, um, since the car is metallic and the conductor, um, all the, the charge and electric field induced by, the, by the, th the lightning strike will be on the external surfaces of the car. Okay, so one of the safest places you can be during a thunderstorm would be actually be in your car. All right, I just want to uh, finish up this chapter, which is working out a few more problems. Then we'll call it a done deal. So, relatively long uh, lecture, but I think most of these lectures will be. So let's work some problems out and then we'll call this a done deal. <clears throat> All right, so um, OpenStax 18.38. Okay, so when a sketch the electric field lines in the vicinity of the conductor, shown, right, sketch electric field lines in the vicinity. of the conductor in figure 18.49. Given the field was originally uniform, and parallel to the object's long axis. Is resulting feels small near the long side of the object. Okay, so um, the object looks like a football. So again, well, um, so sketch electric field lines in the vicinity of the conductor in figure 18.49, given the field was originally uniform and parallel to the object's long axis. Is resulting field small near the long side of the object? Okay, so um, need to uh, erase in order to, in order to be able to draw any you know, real estate purposes here. So. Um, and the object looks like a football. And so originally there was a parallel electric field, but um, as we see, you know, that as the field gets closer, it kind of does a little divot like that. Then we see that there is going to be a more concentration of charges um, in the um, in the places where the uh, where the where the where the where the uh, it's most pointed. 
And then as you go further along, it's going to become uh, less, um, uh, I would say, uh, <clears throat> more spread out. And of course, I would say there should be some symmetry. So again, terminating on negative charges. Again, this always has to enter or leave um, perpendicularly from the surface of the conductor. So there's your electric field. And is it weaker near the long axis? Um, yes, the field is smaller near the long side. So you know, the answer to the question is yes, the field is smaller near the long side. Okay. That's 18.38. Let's do 18.39. Uh, well, I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna continue this. Uh, in the second segment. 